boom, and we're live. Back from Hawaii right before it fucking blows up and sinks into the ocean. Just in time. Woo, we barely made it. When yeah. we were flying above the big island, as we were flying above... It, what's the matter? Nothing's going fine. Okay. As we were flying above the big island, a 6.9 earthquake blew up. Yeah. That's not good. No. Shane Dorian fucking lives there. We looked out the window and saw the island like explode and sink. Remember that? Sad. That was sad. That was sad. But at least, I mean, we had a good hunt. People were surfing, though. Yeah. They caught those waves. Yeah. They were worried about a tsunami. Nah, it's not going to sink, but it's going to get bigger. That's what it is. I mean, the whole thing's a fucking volcano. People are shocked. Wait, the volcano's a volcano? Yeah. Yeah, you live on a goddamn <laughs> volcano. <laughs> Oh, crazy. I wish we would have been able to fly over it, though. How epic oh, no. would that have been? Yeah, I was looking at the like the map of what, the way we fly. We fly so we can't see it the entire way, Yeah, which is bullshit. Yeah. And plus, it was cloudy, which yeah. is also bullshit. <laughs> that would have been cool. Oh. I, I even asked the guy, like, which way do we go? Yeah. Like, that would be fucking awesome if we flew over that thing. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. fuck living on a volcano, though. Oh, man. Good place to visit, though. It's beautiful. Oh, stunning. Yeah, it was yeah. great. And where we were, we were on Lanai, and um, Lanai's an interesting place. 3,000 people, 20,000 deer. Right. And and so you do the math, and you think, hey, this is going to be gravy. There is you know, way more deer than people, but... God, it was, it's tough. It's tough, tough hunting. Yeah. Tough bow hunting, for sure. Well, this is one of the best examples um, of if you want to make an argument for hunting, like this in, in certain situations, this is probably the best example. You must control the population of these animals. They don't have any predators, and they evolved around tigers. They come from India. So these Axis deer, they were a gift from uh, Hong Kong to King Kamehameha V. I in, saw your history lesson. Yeah, in 1860. Yeah. I, I was getting in, all into it today. <laughs> and I wanted to make my post about that it. That was awesome. Um, so they... What did the, how what was the number that they shoot? How many did they, they shoot a week just to just to feed uh, people and control the population? They said fifteen hundred, but not a week, was it? No, I think no. it was thirty a day. Oh, okay, I think yeah. They were yeah. saying they shoot thirty a day, right? Because they have to go at night. Yep, with and, sc- with night night vision scopes and shoot does. Yeah, just to take them out. Just to take them out. Just, yeah, that's so many deer. When we were there at night. Um, we got, first of all, we got, I got super lucky. Thanks to you. You, you let me take that deer. But when, right when we landed, we went to scout, we got out of the car, we went and looked around and within five minutes we saw a buck yeah. feeding in a, in a doable spot. Yeah, nice I deer. creeped in. It was total. It, it was, it, it just gives you a distorted perception of your chances of success though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because for the next five days I got nothing until the last day. But in 15 minutes, I got the first deer. But when you get there, you realize how switched on these things are. Yeah. Like, there's there's nothing like these things. No. It's, uh, you know, I've hunted in Africa, and the, and the antelope there are pretty quick also, just yeah. like that, just because of lions and hyenas and, yeah, just They're twitchy. Just, just super jumpy. Twitchy. But and these deer are very similar, just so quick. When we were leaving that night... When you and me and Adam were in the truck and we were leaving and we turned the lights on in the truck and you could see hundreds of yeah. deer in yeah. front of us. Yeah. It was the craziest, like, it was like a crowd being let out of a concert or something like yeah. that. Or basketball yeah. game. Yeah. Bas- oh, basketball game's over because it was just, <laughs> they're coming out of the trees, yeah. um, crossing the road into the open field where we'd been hunting and it's just hundreds. You can't imagine. If you haven't been there, you can't imagine. And if you... If you moved there or if you just went there for a few days, you'd kind of get it. You'd be like, okay, what do you do about these things? Mm. Well, you can't give them birth control. I mean, they eat grass. So, yeah. like, how are you going to stop them from breeding? You're not. So, what are you going to do? You're going to introduce tigers to Lanai? That would be cool. That may be the only way to do it, other well, than hunters. Yeah. And they're going to start eating people. Just hunting. And yeah. it's, it's such a destination for just getting good deer meat. Yeah. And, I was thinking about it too. That stretch where those hundreds of deer cross the highway, you know, that's, I mean, it's as straight as can be. You can see, I mean, great visibility, but the speed limit's 35. Yeah. I think it's because deer are always jumping out in front of cars there. Oh, yeah, and, I mean, for pe- sure. People would be dying. So it's, it seems like, why is it 35? This is like, it should be 70, but, but so many deer. I think it's also because they're like, where are you going? 
Yeah. Slow down. Yeah, eh? no, there's no hurry. <laughs> What's the hurry, man? Yeah. Relax. I mean, 3,000 people on the island. Maybe that, yeah, that's part of it too. That island's so relaxed and the people are so friendly. That's an yeah. awesome, awesome place. Yeah. It was, uh, I, I'm, anytime I go on a hunt, I mean, I, I'm thankful for the experience and, and for seeing the animals, but also meeting the people, you know, with Alec, yeah. uh, Bob the Butcher. Yeah. Um, there's just like these people that are ingrained in your in your memory and you know that's a, that's such a special part of the trip also yeah the the experience is very uh, very unusual because there's really not a place like that that i know of anywhere on the planet that's just a small island with a small population of people and a massive population of the most delicious animals in the world mm -hmm. and even though there's so many of them Good fucking luck getting one. I yeah. mean, we had like our friend Ben O'Brien. He he went home empty-handed. Yeah. He so one of us in a group of very experienced hunters. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than me, everybody in that group is super super experienced. Yeah. You know, and still it's no cakewalk. These things are switched on, and they no. dodge arrows like they're in the Matrix. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. It's uh, there's no gimmies. No. I mean, it's uh, you can do everything right. You can. You can think in your head, well, I travel all the way here. I'm I'm here to hunt. I, I need to take meat home. It doesn't matter. Those deer, th there's no gimmies. They're trying to stay alive, and they know what's up. They get hunted. I don't know if it's every day because when, they're, when their antlers fall off, you know, the bucks probably aren't hunted. But because they're killing does at night, they're hunted most days out of the year yeah so they are as, as wired as it can be i mean because they're they're used to being pursued yeah it's different than say like mm. white-tailed deer like white-tailed deer seem to kind of know when hunting season comes around yeah like when their velvet drops off and they rub their velvet off and then the the females start coming into season that's when they get fucking sketchy and nervous because they know that guns are going to be going off and yeah arrows are going to be flying their way right but you catch them during the summer they're just kind of chilling. Yeah, these or, things are never chilling. Or in the winter after yeah, season, right? They're just they're uh, more focused on food yeah. and putting on some weight to to make it through the winter. So other than hunting season, they are more chill. But these things, I don't think they ever get a day off. They don't get a day off, and they can't give them a day off because if they just if everybody said, "Hey, man, let's just leave these animals alone, man," <laughs> if they did, they would all die either of starvation yeah. or they would die. like they had to eradicate the goat population on the island because mm -hmm. people brought goats there, and the goats literally had decimated the vegetation to the point where the island started going into a drought. I don't understand this, but somehow or another, if you eat all of the vegetation, the the rain stops falling in certain areas, really? or there's a lack of precipitation, or condensation doesn't gather because there's no no leaves to catch mm. capture it. Or mm -hmm. one of the ladies who lives there was explaining it to me why they had to kill all the goats. Oh, I see. And she was like, trees were dying, everything was dying. And they're in the process right now of, uh, in Maui, they have this gigantic area that they are trying to eradicate deer from, and they want to fence it in to let the forest regrow. Mm -hmm. Because the forest doesn't have a chance to regrow with, again, same animal, axis deer, because they just eat all the little baby trees. Yeah. As the little trees are coming up, they just chew those fuckers up, and that's what they eat. They eat shoots and... They want the new browse. Yeah. Yeah, new growth. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I mean, as far as our trip goes, and that was another thing I wanted to mention too, is the, you said the group of people, Ben was one of them, but, uh, we, we had just a, an awesome group of hunters that are, are all our friends basically. Yeah. And some of the best bow hunters in the world. And it was, uh, man, a, it was a good time hearing the stories from everybody was, yeah. uh, then John Dudley made an amazing meal, cooked up some meat one night and it's, uh, how good is his cooking? <laughs> It's really good. good, man. And that it deer, axis deer, is so delicious. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. It goes with my theory that the fastest things are the most delicious because huh. they're trying to get away because they know they taste good. Yeah, maybe. Mm. Hey. Might be something to that. It salmon? Could be. How good is salmon? They're yeah. like, get me the fuck out of here. I don't like fish. But you don't like fish at all? I like halibut. I like white, white fish. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Shane, Shane Dorian, big wave surfer slash awesome bow hunter. Yeah. Remy Warren, our buddy Adam Greentree, uh, Sam Sohalt, Ben O'Brien. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't know Will's last name. Will from Yeti. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know. Yeah, nice but, guy. Yeah, great guy. But I mean, what a fucking crew. Yeah. It so was, awesome. It was great. It was, uh, and just I, so much respect for guys like the, those guys who are at the top of their game. You know, I mean, bow yeah. hunting, I don't think people realize how hard it is. No. So when I see these guys go out and they're successful w with basically a sharp stick, you know, it's on, a, especially on an animal like that. So a lot of these people, it's new country. Like Adam hadn't been there. I hadn't, I had never been there. Um, when you see guys go out there and do that on a new hunt in new country for new animals, it's, uh, it's impressive. Well, that we really did. Like, look at that. That's the goddamn A team <laughs> taking me and Kimmy out of the mix and yeah. Will. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> he got a deer, though. He did get a deer. I'm just <laughs> fucking with him. He's a good dude. No, he's nice. But, I mean, but, but what I'm saying is, like, you and Dudley and Adam and Remy, I mean, fucking straight assassins. And Shane. I mean, yeah, Shane, Shane. And he lives out there. But people don't know. Like, Shane is world renowned as a big wave surfer, but he's an awesome bow hunter. I mean, he's really excellent. And does it all the time out there, spot and stalk, crawling around the bushes. Yeah. I crawled. I mean, you were there the last day when I, sh I shot my last deer. I crawled a quarter of a mile. Yeah. To yeah. get to these fuckers. Yeah. They, they were up on the hill. I was watching you guys from an elevated spot up on top of the hill, and I was I when you guys were up walking from a mile, I could see you easy. You know, I mean, binoculars, yeah. no problem. And then all of a sudden, you're gone. And so I sent Alec a text. I'm like. Why are you guys hiding from me? Because I would just like have to really glass, really glass, and then I'd be like, "There's a head." Okay, there's a head. Okay, now I see you guys. But it was yeah, crawling for a long time. Um, let me think how long. I would say an hour almost. Yeah, we crawled for an hour. An hour. Yeah. To get a quarter mile, and it, that is a lot of work. Yeah. You know, you got a bow, so you had a bow in your hand. I didn't have anything, but you're moving that bow with each. Yeah. Whatever you crawling step and and it's basically doing a plank for an hour yeah i was i was winded by the time we got to where the deer were and yeah. now it's like take a deep breath take a deep breath because we got within 55 yards and i'm like we're good right here like yeah. this is a good spot we're behind a bush but it like my shoulders were sore for, it was like yeah. i was doing push-ups yeah because like you're you're crawling like a cat so you're just and you're trying to be super quiet so yeah. like if you saw us do it People that are listening, you're crawling, but you're not just kind of crawling along. No. You're crawling as quietly as you can. Yeah. And it, it gave me a, a deep respect for camouflage, too. Mm -hmm. Like, I was wearing a camouflage face mask and a hat, and I had a camouflage backpack. By the final day, I had gloves on. I was fucking fully camoed. <laughs> We, I took the shoes off. We were crawling. A lot of it was in wool socks just so you could be even more quiet. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's no you the, you can't take too great of measures on being more stealthy or quiet on these animals. Yeah, and uh, immediately I put up the post and uh, I I saw one negative comment. I'm like I'm not, not even reading this shit. One of the things that happened while I was there was my phone fucked up. I dropped my phone on the first day, mm -hmm. and when I dropped my phone on the first day, it just went haywire. It wouldn't work anymore. And so I had to get a new phone. Mm -hmm. So I ordered a new phone and had it shipped to the island. And when I was doing that, I didn't use anything. I didn't use any apps. I didn't check my email. I didn't check Twitter. And I felt better. I felt better. He went cold turkey. I went cold turkey for three yeah. days. Yeah. And while I was out there going cold turkey, I was like, I feel better. Like, this is better. Like, checking all that stuff all the time. Like, do I need to know about the Mueller probe? 24 7 do i no i don't do think i need so. to i don't what do, about stormy daniels do i need to know what the latest <laughs> stormy daniels lawsuit is if i was a super billionaire character i'd give stormy daniels money and go please stop no Just but everybody i don't i don't want any here what do you want? you want money you want money i'm not even saying that he's not guilty or that she's you know she's in the wrong i don't think she is but what are you looking for Let's, can we get this out of the news? I don't, I don't need to hear this anymore. He fucked you. I get it. Yeah, well, a lot of people fucked a lot of people since that uh, time. You know what's irritating? What? You pay $135,000, like, okay, so you're going to just keep it on the DL, right? We're good, 135 and yeah. then get the money. Now she's talking. Well, what kind of deal is that? I don't think she has that money anymore. <laughs> I think she spent it. Oh, oh, she needs more money. I think she needs more money. Yeah. Okay. And I think she realizes this is an opportunity for, you know, 
I don't know how to look at it. Because on one hand, I'm like, well, I think we should hold the president up to higher standards. And you, you shouldn't be able to just lie all the time and be the president. Because how could we trust you if it comes to something serious, like mm-hmm. a, a war with China or some, something crazy or invading Iran? Let's just go off the charts yeah. with craziness. Yeah. I, I got to be able to trust you with everything. If I can't trust you that you... You don't want to tell everybody that you banged a porn star. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if he just had a, a, a press conference and, ladies and gentlemen, who cares? Yeah, who cares? Yeah, I I, I enjoy sex. Good. I enjoy sex. I'm a heterosexual man. It Look at my beautiful years, wife, Melania. Yeah, ten I years sh- before yeah. he was elected or whatever yeah. it was. It's, it's like, like I shouldn't have fucked this porn star, but I couldn't help myself. I'm a pig. Yeah, but I'm doing a good job as a president. Economy is up. Yeah, unemployment's down. Thank you. Good night. Support the troops. <laughs> Support the troops. <laughs> Support the NRA. Hey, but what? Here's one thing. So, you say you can't trust him because if he'll lie about this stuff. Yeah. But, okay. So you say another president? How do you know they're not lying? They are lying. Yeah. So they're, I mean, I think they've all lied. I think. Look, one of the things that. You know, I had a conversation with a friend of mine about uh, Hillary Clinton, and he's uh, he's a big Hillary Clinton supporter to the point where. It's like he like Jamie with the Cavaliers hat on. He might as well have a Hillary Clinton hat on. He's like a, a Hillary <laughs> do Clinton. They have those? So, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they had them, right? <laughs> I'm with her. This guy is a him and his wife are both like super Hillary supporters. Yeah. And I'm like, it doesn't bother you at all that she deleted thirty thousand emails. It doesn't yeah. bother you at all. Right. Like they told her there's a probe, we need to see all your emails, she just deleted them all. That doesn't yeah. bother you? Like that doesn't seem like maybe she's a liar. Right. And then when you hear Comey's account of what happened versus is her account of what happened she's clearly not being honest that doesn't right. bother you and he's like well I, I think in comparison she doesn't lie as much I'm like what are you talking about like these are lies it doesn't yeah. matter in comparison right? right so my point is I think anybody who gets to that level of that business yeah. is slimy right. in one way or another you're everyone's slimy maybe but we would like you to not be yeah It'd be great. We'd like everybody to not be. <laughs> yeah, he, I don't know. I think the only way to get to the bottom of it is get him on the podcast. I would love to get him on the podcast. I'd love to get him drunk. You know, so that, drink. that's, oh, that's what I was wondering. So, you know, most people have podcasts uh, that aren't the, that's Joe, almost, the Joe Rogan. But that's almost true right now. Like most people do have podcasts. <laughs> no, I know. But well, okay, no, let me finish. So most people that do, they'd be like, they got this get this uh, dream guest list, you know, the the wish list. And these yeah. are my I'd love to have these people. When I was thinking about you, it's like it seems like, and I don't know, I'm not you, but like the Courtney DeWalter, the people you're interested in are more important to you than say like the the A li- the like a the president of the United States. I mean, yeah. so what? How do you do? You have a, a wish list of guests. I don't have a wish list. No, no, no. We were talking about this on the plane ride. I don't. I like talking to my friends. Yeah. I like talking to you. Yeah. I like talking to interesting people, like uh, the sleep expert I had on the other day, Matthew Walker. No, I don't like him. Or Pete. You didn't he's like. T- he's no, he's tell, telling he's giving me you negative stuff. Yeah, he I don't, sleeps three no. hours a night. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't like that. So I'll, I'm going to ignore him that you said that. That guy. Uh, you, Monday we have Michael Chandler. I'm looking <laughs> yes. forward to that. Yes. I like uh, I like talking to interesting people. Yeah. Like, they don't have to be famous to me at all. Right. Okay. Some of my favorite podcasts are people that aren't famous at all. Yeah. They're just I like people that are interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean that's obviously a pretty blanket statement. Right. But I like people that are doing things that are unique. People that are that are like masters at a craft. Mm-hmm people that are working hard, people that inspire me. I like to be inspired. You know, I like right. I like talking to people who are curious and who've studied things, you know, whether it's Sean Carroll or Neil deGrasse Tyson or some people that understand things that I don't understand right. so I could pick their brain and okay. ask them questions about stuff. That to me is interesting. But Trump, having sitting down with Trump would be to me like a lot like sitting down with my friend Alex Jones. Like it's, it'd be like, okay, like <laughs> it would be inter- you're the best. I would be like, okay, <laughs> I get it. if you talk to him for three hours, yeah, what kind of crazy stuff would come out? It'd be awesome. I really think that if he wasn't president, I would like him. 
I would really, I would like him. I would, th I would think he's a character. If I didn't have mm -hmm. business to do with him, where I was worried about like, you know, getting screwed over in some sort of a deal or something like that, yeah, I would like him because yeah. I would think he's a wild man. He's a character. Yeah, he's a fucking seventy-year-old dude with crazy fucking hair. He w wears a, a red bat baseball hat everywhere that says "Make America Great Again." On that's like, awesome. You can't even wear that hat in <laughs> bars. Could you imagine that he is so divisive? Like mm -hmm. he's so the people are so conflicted one side or the other against him that if you wear that hat they will kick you out of places yeah what world do we live in yeah where you can't wear something that says make america great again yeah how how could that be considered anything but positive how's i don't understand right? but he's people hate him so much well and that's so that's to me even a, a, a great accomplishment from what he's done is like he's got so much hate and he's still look at all the positives that happen well, most people don't think any positives have happened because if most people live... Am I most people? No, no, no. Because I think there has been. Well, I think most people live in an echo chamber. Yeah. And if you're like my friend who's a giant Hillary Clinton supporter, yeah. all you hear is Trump's Negative. the devil. Yeah. And, you know, he was like completely convinced that it was going down and Trump's going to be kicked out of office in the first 60 days and he's like mm -hmm. trust me it's not gonna last a year i'm like it's yeah. not gonna last a year <laughs> yeah a year later he's crying he's fucking pulling his hair out he's yeah. going crazy yeah you know like remember keith olbermann yeah keith olbermann he, oh he retired God. that show he's Good. like yeah, i don't need to do this anymore it's just a matter of days that yeah. was fucking six months ago yeah i think when did he when did he quit the resistance i don't know it was it wasn't soon enough. I think he just had to fucking take a break. I think he was losing his marbles. Well, no, the, but they're so interested in the negative narrative that they're not, they won't even promote anything positive. So it's like when he was talk, saying all the rocket man stuff, it's like, oh, yeah. Trump's going to cause a nuclear war. Okay, now he's talking and now they're in negotiations with North Korea and South, North and South are, are talking and he's like, oh, Trump had nothing to do with it. It's like, well, how could he almost start a nuclear war and then have nothing to do with what's going on? It's like, you, it can't be both. Right. Well, I guess it probably could if they were like, listen, let's not start a nuclear war. How about you and I talk? Yeah. Like North and South Korea goes, let's get together and figure this out. This crazy asshole on the other side of the country. Maybe, uh, whatever. On the other side of the world, rather. Okay, so he's he deserves credit for that Something in some happened. respect. He's very... He's a very interesting guy in the fact that his methods are so outrageous and uh, outside the norm mm -hmm. that I don't think these world leaders know what the fuck to do with him. Yeah. When he's calling him rocket man. Yeah, I know. You know, and then like and my buttons bigger than yours. What? Yeah. What? He, he says crazy <laughs> shit. He says crazy shit. And but that's what he's always done. Yeah. Yeah. So it's he's consistent. We just expect him to do something different because he's the president. Right. You know? Yeah. Now you're working. We were talking about this on the plane, too, that you're working with uh, what is your your position in the administration because you actually have a wildlife conservation position now yeah, in the yeah, government right how, yeah. did you ever fucking think that was going to happen no no i didn't how the hell did this even come up oh god um i don't know i'm on the international wildlife conservation council whoa yeah I that's, that's legit that's a hell of i got a, a business no i don't have a business card but if i did you should it, get a belt buckle for that i should <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was thinking about the belt buckle. So I, then I was like, I was like, so you said you wanted a belt buckle. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'll give him my belt buckle that I wore on the hunt. But then I'm thinking, so I, so I gave you the belt buckle. But then I'm like, oh, shit, maybe he wants a new belt buckle no, 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 in, no. in the box with the sweet custom box. No, no, no. So no. I didn't want to be disrespectful and try to say, here's a used belt. You no, know? the used one has blood on it. Yeah, it does. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. I okay, like it. Okay. I just wanted, perfect. I wanted to no. make sure you were good with that because I wasn't, I just want <laughs> I want you to want or get what you want, basically. Um, so International Wildlife Conservation Council. So I, I don't know how it started because I'm like, man, there are some powerful people on there. Safari Club International people, uh, super successful business people and, and uh, political um, campaign type contributors. And then, you know, we go to this meeting. There's 16 of us on the council. Are you dressed like this? I'm just like this. Cowboy boots, foil yes. shirt. <laughs> just like this, dude. This And, and everybody else is wearing suits suit and ties. ties. And I'm like... Do they give oh you grief God. for dressing like that? Not to my face, but They're maybe probably later. Like this fucking Oregon hillbilly. <laughs> yes, probably. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I'm on there. I don't. Who contacted you? Um, 
sec or the interior department. So, so like you're in the middle of a run, running up Mount Pisgah. Yeah. yeah. And I, no, I got a call, Washington D.C. Shut I'm the like, fuck up. Swear to God. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, what, what have I done? Is, yeah, <laughs> this can't be good. Because it was after. Okay, so Trump put out the tweet and he said something like, he doesn't see how hunting for elephants is conservation or or helps wildlife it's a it's a horror show doesn't yeah. help elephants or any other animal something like that and i was like what in the hell is that what are we talking about you know elephants talk about elephants that's fine whatever but he said or any other animal yeah so i took that tweet i i posted it and addressed it and, and i don't know if he saw it i don't really know but soon after that i got a call for this thing and so because I was, you know, I know just from hunting in Africa and how it works and um, that hunting is necessary over there if the animals are going to survive. If, if That's the, a complicated story. It's yeah. a complicated situation. But people, uh, people don't want to hear that. No. And so here's an example. of In Tanzania, there was a, the largest hunting concession. And I'm trying to think how big it was I, I i can't put the the number on how big it was but they'd been in business for 40 years so a hunting concession is is they have you know hunters from usually america go over there they pay for the for the access to the land and they pay for the right to hunt these animals so this place had been in business for 40 years um they went out of business because of this import ban obama put an import ban on uh the ivory of elephants coming back as trophies but also lions. and lions yeah, yeah. the and lion thing was right after cease of the lion and it was done mm -hmm. as a political measure right so he put a ban on you, you can go over there and hunt them still because you know we're from america we can't say what's legal in africa but he can say what he did was say well you can hunt them whatever because i can't control that but you can't bring them home so nobody's going to go and, and spend seventy five thousand to kill an elephant or fifty thousand to kill a lion if they can't bring it home Right? right so that basically shut down hunting and um um this outfit in tanzania that had been in business for 40 years they closed they went out of business about i think it was about two months ago now and what happens is when they don't have the the concession they can't pay for that land it, it is given back to the people and for us here, they'll be like, oh, that's great. You gave the land back to the people. No, it's not good to give the land back to the people there because the people can't do anything. They don't have any money. They're, they don't. They're just like, so what happens is the poachers, as soon as the hunting concession moves out, poachers move in and kill every animal. The only reason the animals that were being protected in that hunting concession was because it, there was hunting in there. These, this outfit would spend, I think, in the last three years – they spent over $2 million on anti-poaching efforts. So $2 million to protect basically their investment, which is those animals that were in there. Yeah, they'd kill a couple because um, elephants were hunted and they ran the hunts and, and probably lions. But by and large, they're protecting the majority of the herd. Well, well give, me the, give me those numbers again because you were, you were giving me the numbers on elephants legally and illegally killed. Right. So, so, and I asked this back at our first International Wildlife Conservation Council meeting. And this, you know, PETA was there and all these animal rights activists, um, I don't want to say psychos, so that could be disrespectful. But anyway, these extremists were there. And so it was kind of heated in some point, some cases. But I did ask this question, how many elephants are killed legally in Africa each year? And the number is about 400. 400 are killed legally. In the entire continent yeah, of Africa. Uh, yeah, it's a big area. Which is so big that you can get America, the United States of America. You can also get all the European countries. You can fit a lot of shit in Africa. It's Africa's huge. Huge yeah. place. Yeah, and so there's some, there's some areas where you're not going to hunt elephants because there's not, there, there. There's yeah. not enough. Or... Um, they don't live there, but there's some areas where there's too many elephants. It's just yeah, that's what's confusing to people. People hear elephants are going extinct. Well, yeah, they are in some places. Yeah, and then in other places, the problem is with local farmers. They have these plots of land, and the elephants come in and eat everything and destroy mm -hmm. their land, and they can't do anything about it. What are you going to do this? How the, how big is an elephant? How many thousands of pounds? Ten thousand pounds or I some shit? Even, I don't even know. They're huge. They're huge. But they you don't, can't do a goddamn thing. They don't about care it. about elephants. They, the no. people that they're like the elephant is ruining my crop. Yeah, that's what I need to eat. Yeah, I'm going to kill the elephant. It's going to lay there and rot. Yeah, there's these 
these people are starving. I yeah. mean, they, it's there's a food chain going on there, and humans here where we are, we're we're so far above the food chain that we're like sitting in a platform, looking down, watching it. They're they're no, embedded in it. They're there. ground level. They're in there. It's it's the whole it's a whole analogy of you can't have first world world people solving third world problems. Yeah, that's you a good know? point of it. And it's just we we people here have all the answers. It's like you have everything you want. You have you live in excess. Yeah. You're fat. You have you throw food away. What are you talking about? You have no idea what it's like in Africa. So there 400 elephants are killed legally. 30,000 are poached a year. 30,000. And the reason that's happening is because the hunting had to move out. The hunting closed down or hunting is what pays for the anti-poaching efforts. But when hunting money isn't there, the poachers run rampant. 30,000 elephants. That's it's, why they are devastated. It's such a not hunting. It's such a hard thing for people to swallow because what I this is from the point of view of someone who loves wildlife, I think this is what people want. What they want is the humans to leave the animals alone and the animals to live in this state of bliss mm -hmm. where they exist perfectly and the balance of nature of predator and prey all plays out in a natural way without people going over there and shooting elephants and then mm -hmm. sticking their tusks on their wall. Yeah. I mean, we've all seen those pictures of these giant fat fucks holding a rifle, standing over yeah. a lion, and you're like, this is just looks wrong yeah it looks like american gluttony makes its way over to africa and some guy shoots a line with a rifle now he's standing on its head and he's going to mm -hmm. put it on his wall in his yeah. fat fucking house somewhere that bothers people i it get it i get it too i i mean I, i'm not arguing that yeah, but, but you got to fix africa first yeah and you, you're not trying so this idea that if you just leave all those animals alone and stop hunting them everything's going to be fine no they're going to be wiped out you gotta, people have to look at it pragmatically first and then idealistically. Because mm -hmm. pragmatically, you have to understand that these animals 20 years ago were on the verge of extinction. So many different antelopes, so many different uh, what we would call game animals, animals that people eat, were on the verge of extinction mm -hmm. until they started instituting these big hunting concessions and having people come in from Europe and America and hunting in Africa. Then the community started to prosper because if someone's paying, you know, I don't know, how much is it to shoot like a, a, a Neil guy or something like that? Oh, maybe 1500 So think of how many of those things get shot and yeah. some of that money goes to the ranch, some of that money goes to the professional hunting guys, anti-poaching conservation efforts, and then you have unprecedented numbers. There's more of those animals today than there have been in decades. Yeah. And it's all because people put value on them. Yeah, it's all about the animals have to have value. And people say, no, well, the animal has value being alive. It's like, okay. Well, it does stop. to you. Stop. It does to you if you yeah. don't live over there, if you're not poor and your children right. aren't starving to death. A, a, a picture of, an, of a lion is amazing. Okay, yeah. and that animal is beautiful. There's value in it being alive. But you gotta understand those people need to eat. They need to work. So if they're not wor working for the hunting concession, if the hunting concession goes out of business like the largest one in Tanzania did after 40 years, what are they going to do? They can't go get a job at the mill. You know what I mean? There's yeah, no, there's, nothing there, there's there. not industry over there. So what happens is as they, some of those people, and I, I don't know for a fact, but I would, I'm going to make an educated guess that they would go from working as anti-poaching officers or, or, or helping keep the animals alive as, as part of the anti-poaching program, straight to poaching. Yeah, well, that that's happened back and forth both ways, right? Yeah. Former poachers became anti-poaching officers when the opportunity presented right. itself. And they were great ones because they knew how, how it worked, and right. they knew where the weaknesses were, were, and that saved animals. But it's just like, it, it's, it's sad because that, you know, that last two months without that hunting concession there, without the anti-poaching um, program in place, I guarantee it's been a slaughter. The animals that were being protected are now just being slaughtered by poachers. And again, the difference between looking at things pragmatically and looking at things idealistically. Idealistically, we would like all those people in Africa to have plenty of food and plenty of opportunity for employment and plenty of things to do with their life, but they don't. Yeah. You know, and the, the situation that had emerged with these hunting concessions is superior to the situation that's in place now. Yeah. And it's also superior for the animals themselves, including the lions. In Zimbabwe, 
they had to kill look, look this up Jamie see if you could because they had to call I think it was something along the lines of 200 lions recently because they had d decimated the undulate population because mm -hmm. they weren't kept in check All right because the undulate po the, the way these uh, the balance of nature works out is you have to have a balance between predator and prey yeah the only way to keep the balance of predator is humans mm -hmm. that's it it's the only thing that exists unless they keep it. Yeah. Zimbabwe Wildlife Reserve will call 200 lions to control a population explosion, claiming hunters have been scared off by the outcry over the of the lion. Yeah. The whole thing is so weird because what people just jump on it, you know, that you watch The Lion King, oh, Simba, no, don't kill Simba. Mm -hmm. And oh, Cecil, he's got a name. And all this craziness, it got to such a weird point where there was this discussion about Cecil's brother. That Cecil's brother got Jericho. killed. Jericho. And yeah. they were like, oh my God, they killed Jericho. And then people were relieved because they found it was a different lion mm -hmm. and it wasn't Cecil's brother Jericho. So yeah. this is like they're watching a goddamn reality show. It's like right. keeping up with the Kardashians yeah. in Africa. Yeah. Like, what do you give a shit what the fucking name of the, Al the African... Uh, lion is yeah. you're crazy. Yep. It's not Jericho. Oh, it's 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 Michael the lion So it's okay. Yeah, that's crazy. It's still a fucking lion But this shows you this <laughs> first world view of of this wildlife situation That is not ideal by any stretch of the imagination yeah. I think part of it like with that the whole Cecil lion thing it gave people a purpose It's like oh, right. I have something to stand for I right. got I have a purpose now and that's where I know people are struggling out there finding What's my purpose? What yeah. am I doing? You know, and they're spinning their wheels. They don't, I don't know what they do, but that gave them something to fight for. Yeah. And it wasn't right. It didn't help anything. It hurt those 200 lions could have been $50,000 each to a hunter. $10 million would have went to Zimbabwe, stayed there or, or at least employed people. Um, but no, they, they were killed and there's no gain. Yeah, it still sucks. All across the board, it sucks. The whole situation sucks. These weird uh, high fence operations where they let lions loose and then they let them out of the cage and then people show up that day and the lions don't know what the fuck's going on and they shoot this lion and yeah. then stand up. That sucks too. Yeah, I it's, don't like that. The whole thing is weird. It's, no. it's not... Look, wildlife in Africa and high fence wildlife is not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. And these animals that were going extinct and now aren't, because people were hunting them, it's fucking strange. That's mm -hmm. a strange balance. Yeah. Like that, the only reason they exist is so people can come over there and shoot them. Like we, don't, I don't, I don't want that. I mean, yeah. I would like them to just exist. Well, the thing, yeah, but people aren't going to contribute that money to to right. pay for the anti poaching just to go take a picture. It's like if it's you just go, not going to happen. If you go to the Missouri Breaks or something like that, and you go hunting mule deer, like those. That's what I like. I like animals that exist because they they're, they're there. This yeah. is their spot. This is where they are. Like if you go to the Missouri breaks and you go up into those those hills and and look for for mule deer, those yeah. fuckers have been there for thousands of years. I mean, they have found skulls of deer of white-tailed deer in Florida that are two million years old. Right, they're the exact same animal two million years ago. So for millions of years, longer than there have been human beings, mm -hmm. those things have been in that form, running around North America and wherever the fuck they can. That's what I yeah. like. I, I like that too. But don't forget that hunting has played a part in keeping those numbers healthy. Sure. You know, the yeah. deer and the elk. There's more deer. Uh, there's no. Big game animal North, big game animals in North America now than there were a hundred years ago, and that's through hunting and conservation. That is true, but it's also because a hundred and fifty years ago people went fucking ham yeah. and wiped out most of them. I mean, right. it was, it was well, real bad when they were doing market learned, hunting before refrigeration. Exactly. Yeah. But but we've learned from that. We yeah. learned okay, this is how this is how we need to do it. This yeah. is how hunting fits in this equation, and that's where. You know, we talked about the International Wildlife Conservation Council. Well, that's given me a, a way in to talk about a bunch of other things, too. Yeah. So one of those, and we talk about animals in North America, is uh, Ryan Zinke, who's the Secretary of Interior. He uh, created this new, I guess it's a bill. I'm not like this political expert. I'm a bow hunter, right? I, I wear a flannel shirt and baseball hat. But he did create this, uh, um, I'm going to call it a bill. But that protects the the winter 
that we call them wildlife corridors. So it's where the animals can go from the summer, summer range to the winter range, where there's not going to be development there. So he created that because that's how those animals, like in Montana, make it through the winter. Right. If, if they're up in the su- summer, um, they make it through um, getting in fall, and then all of a sudden winter hits. They have to have a way down into the low country to where they can – their winter migration to where they can survive – the snow and, and where they can make down and there's good feed down there. If there's gas rigs or mineral mineral extraction efforts going on that impede that, then they might get hung up up there and get stuck in the snow and die. So he realizes that he realized the need for that. And he created this this new program that's going to make sure that there's no development in there. It keeps those corridors open, and that's that's why our numbers do so well is because there's people like that with the vision on keeping our animals healthy. Well, this is another thing that we talked about uh, on the flight that I think is important to bring up. Remember when there was this talk about the state monument or the national monument in Utah Mm -hmm. and Patagonia put that thing on their page, the president stole your land. Yeah. Explain what actually happened because it's not what everybody thinks it is. Mm -hmm. And and Ranella said it best that if you say the president stole your land, you're not being accurate with your words. That's no. not what happened. It was Patagonia did an awesome marketing job. I mean, in that those efforts by saying the president stole your land, from what I've heard, it resulted in a fifteen percent increase in business for them. So it, it worked <laughs> great. But what the truth is is, a lot of people felt like Obama when he before he left office did. Um, an overreach on the National Monument protection. And so there's protecting a national monument, and then, which is a certain area, he protected, he wanted to encompass 2 million acres in that National Monument designation, which seems excessive. What Zinke says, the Secretary of Interior, he went in there and he said, that's an excessive, that's an overreach. I want to scale it back to what it was before Obama did that. Now, why is it excessive, though? This is what gets confusing to people. People think that protecting the land is never excessive. Right. What he wants to do is make sure people have access. And what, and it's like, okay. So what's the difference between the, what, the way it is under Obama and the way it is under Zinke? It'll be Zinke scaled it back to what it was before, which that would be it's still national forest, still federal land. But you'd be able to, and I'm not sure if it, if it was wilderness or how the access would be, but what Zinke would say is that, like, I would be able to go into the land all the time, that 2 million acres, because I might be considered by some to be elite, you know, because I can walk for 20 miles. Not everybody in the United States can walk 20 miles to get somewhere. So they want to put road systems in There's there. road systems already. He There's road to, systems already, but... Wants to maintain the roads. So, but if it was a national monument, right? then no road systems? Like, what is the difference? The, I think the road systems would be gated off, and it'd be walk-in tra- walk only. Foot tra- traffic only, hmm. instead of access through the roads. Now, why did Obama make it 2 million acres I don't know. and close off the roads? I'm not sure. So it's still federal land. So it's yeah. not like the government sold the land nope. off. No. And no mining permits have been issued. No. There's no plans to drill or anything like that. No, when I when I looked that up because I was unsure about it and I talked with Zinke about it just because it's you know, I'm learning all this as we go also. Mm-hmm. And I was concerned when when I read the president stole your land, I'm like, what's this about? Um and so uh what what it is is what he what Zinke wants to do is he wants to just make sure people of not all abilities, because it's not like we want roads on every mountain, but have access to to national forests. So people that can drive in four by fours, you know, those little off road on, on existing Ranger roads. Yeah. yeah, on existing roads, and it's just like national forest now. National right. forest now has roads. Right. Right. Designated wilderness areas, because then I talked about that too. I'm like, well, okay, I understand. I understand access. I said, that's great. I want people to be able to enjoy the great outdoors also. But I also grew up hunting the Eagle Cap Wilderness, which is Oregon's largest wilderness area, 356,000 acres of no roads. And I don't want roads in there. I I don't want access in the middle of the heart of that wilderness because it's some of the most pristine, beautiful country in the lower 48. I like it like that. So 
we still need to be able to protect those areas. But this wasn't, and this one, this is Bears Ears in, in Utah. This wasn't changing anything, opening up anything, or, or this big nefarious plan of, of mining and stripping everything That's out what of everybody's there. worried right, about. Right, right. They, they were. But all it did, it went back to what it was before. And at that time, when I researched it, there had been no mining permits that, from what I understand, is there is no mineral. There's not, an, there's minerals in there, but not enough to warrant going in there and setting up a full mineral, mineral extraction mine. So the only roads. reason that they changed the distinction is to allow people to have more access to that wilderness through roads that already exist. It wouldn't be wilderness. It'd be national forest. Okay. The federal lands. Yeah. So w why the uproar then? Like, why is everybody uh, so confused? Is it a lack of communication? Is it a, a lack of understanding about what the difference in the distinctions of the two things are? Uh, it, it's just creating, uh, you know, a negative narrative. It's, it's, saying it's something changed you know obama had it this way uh zinke scaled it back that right there is like why what's going on mm -hmm. not really doing the research about he's not he's just putting it back to what it was because he thought that it was a overreach by obama so it's just you know these these outfits they're in business um you know if everything's going good th there's really no reason for people to get fired up and contribute money you know some of these some of these it's political in some respects business is political um, that's very cynical though I, I i see what you're saying but i think that really what's going on is people are very concerned and they see any movement people and change, are concerned but i'm talking the businesses out. yeah but even the businesses like patagonia's business is about the outdoors that's their whole business yeah so they see anything that's a change and the, the trump administration especially in, in the beginning when it came in People were really worried about them in, mm -hmm. in terms of environmental concerns, right? Yeah. Because they had opened up offshore drilling. They had done yeah. a lot of things that people were really freaked out about. They had opened up, what was the area, Jamie, in Alaska where they were going to open up drilling that was near uh, salmon runs that people were very, very concerned about? They, they were concerned about the idea of money above nature. Yeah. Like, and then I was, me too. Right. And who's making that money? You're not making money. No. I'm not making any of that money. So someone else is going to make money off of what's supposed to be our land and our public land, which you and I could maybe go, even though you don't like salmon, we could go salmon fishing mm -hmm. in this land. Well, it could get fucked up by someone else making billions of dollars in oil or natural gas or whatever the right. fuck we do if they contaminate that. I don't want that. No, I, I don't. Know want you that. don't want that either. And the no. people from Patagonia don't want that either. So when they see something like this come up, their red flags go up. They want to get people outraged. They want to get people activated because they think that there might be a chance that if you protest enough, you can stop something like this happening before it does. Right. Because if you do look at like what happened in Alaska with that big oil spill in the 80s or what happened with the BP oil spill in the Gulf Coast, like that shit's devastating. Yeah. When for something sure. like that does happen, someone else is profiting, making fucking billions of dollars yeah. while our our planet that we all share is getting fucked up. You're not making a nickel off of it. I'm not making a nickel off of it, mm -hmm. but they're making billions of dollars and they're fucking up the land. And by the <clears throat> government, by Trump or anybody else, whoever's opening it up, giving them access to drill right. and to do all this thing, you open up the possibility of ruining something that's amazing. Well, so there's always going to be a balance though. There's, you can't just say, okay, nobody can drive past this point forever. You know what I mean? There's always so. But you're saying that about the Eagle Cap Wilderness. You don't want them right? to drive past. There's got to be areas. There's got to be areas we have to protect wilderness right. areas. But for example, where we've elk hunted in Colorado, right? Big bulls, awesome elk hunting. There's natural gas wells all over. Right. It's great elk hunting. Yeah, they've got so to figure out balance. where they're not. Yeah, they're not fucking it up. So I'm. Yeah, so, I'm, yeah I don't want things wiped out in a in a huge mineral extraction mine right. that where there's used to be beautiful whatever right. i don't want that beautiful but, rivers that are polluted right. now but right. you can't just say we're not doing anything anywhere mm -hmm. it doesn't work well so there can be a balance just like where we've hunted in colorado there can be a balance but the real concern that the average person has me included is that someone is going to profit and by doing that where where it's not going to benefit you or anybody we know it's going to fuck it up for everybody else yeah that's N the real concern no for sure i know that's why i've tried to you know, 
that's why I've wanted to be involved. Like, yeah, I'm on that council, which has nothing to do with public lands in North America, but it's given me a way to get in there and try to learn more. That's all I'm trying to do. Well, you also were involved with it when Jason Chavitz had that proposal in Utah to sell off public chunks land. of public land. You were one of the people that sat down with him and got his take on it. And ultimately, because the outcry from people who love the outdoors yeah. and hunters and fishermen, that was stopped. Yeah, Which it is was. very interesting. Yeah, And that, Jason, uh, he took a lot of shit, but he seems like a very reasonable guy. I think so, too. It's, um, you know, he's out of politics now. What now, is he doing? He's on Fox News. Oh, he's a, a co correspondent now? Yeah, yeah. Good he's So he's completely, he was a congressman out of Utah. Yeah. And I went back to D.C. and talked to Talk to him that was hr 622 and that was they wanted to sell just what they determined disposable public land and i'm like okay wait a second who says what's disposable because what's disposable to you might not be to me maybe right. it's a, a great hunting area so i didn't really like there wasn't really a way to determine what was disposable right that, that's what caught my attention and other not just mine but even people like steve ranella yeah and a lot of people in the loop and in the know and I got advice from, um, let's see, Randy Newberg, Steve Ranella, Joel Webster at the uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Cons uh, Conserv Conservation Program. All those guys are really experts in the field. Backcountry hunters and anglers. A lot, I, had, a lot of, you didn't I didn't talk, talk to, them. to them. I didn't. All those people were super active about right. getting people to complain and, yeah. and protest this. And so that one, that I did get a chance to go back there and I did a podcast with uh, Chaffetz and yeah, he pulled it. It was gone. Never happened. But yes, that's, I mean, we just need to be educated on it. And I just don't like the, the, I don't know, without that education, jumping, jumping in on the bandwagon and saying, yeah, the president stole my land. It's right. like, what, well, is that even true? Well, you know, I always defer to Ranella when it comes to things like this, because he's so well versed in it. So when he said that you're not being accurate with your words, I yeah. had to look into it deeper, but I didn't yeah. really understand it totally until I was talking to you and you were explaining to me the distinction between how it was before Obama was in office, yep. what Obama changed, mm -hmm. and then bringing it back to how it was before. So it's still federal land. Yep. No one sold it off. No. It's not. It's just giving people more access through roads. But amazing how when something like that happens, there's this gigantic outcry. Yeah. And everybody freaks out. Yeah. It's, uh, it's confusing. It can be confusing because I'll read two different things and I'll be like, oh my God, yeah. what is what it this or is it that? Is going on? I don't know. Yeah. So that's where I, you know, and people say, oh, well, Zinke, he was lying to your face. I'm like, uh, I don't know. Maybe, but. On video? Uh, yeah. I doubt it. I, I don't. He doesn't seem like that guy. He, he seems like he's a straight, sh you know, I asked him about, he was getting beat up because the National um, Parks Advisory Board wouldn't he wouldn't meet with them that's what it was and so he got said you know zinke doesn't care about national parks and he won't meet with the advisory board and and so i asked him about that because that was in the news and that was just like man he maybe he doesn't care about public land you know i mean i didn't know what was going on so i wanted to ask him about that i'm like well they resigned in protest because you wouldn't meet with him what was that and he goes well yeah you're right i wouldn't meet with him he goes here's how it went I came in as Secretary of Interior in, in charge of I don't know how many different councils, just like the international one I'm on and this park advisory board that what we're talking about. And there's, I think, 200 and some that he's – he really – I think he over – I don't even – thousands of employees, billions of dollars. And all he asked was for these advisory boards, he wanted um, a report written up that said – what have you done in the last two years? What are you working on now? And what's your goals for the next two years? Once you provide me with that report, then I'll get up to speed and I'll meet with you. They never did it. So he didn't meet with them. And that was it. So the story was he, he wouldn't meet with them and they resigned in protest. But the other half of the story was he asked them to do something so he could get up to speed and, and be educated on what's going on. And he n never supplied it. Well, if... They are the typical government employees. And what is the typical government employee? Incompetent, lazy. Wait, I, I'm a government employee. <laughs> <laughs> but what Keep are, going. Typical. Oh, typical. What do, what do people think of? What do people think of? They think of incompetent, lazy, yeah. you know, entitled. 
bureaucrats. Yeah, and they've got this job, and like yeah. all of a sudden he's asking them to provide not not just tell them what they've done, but tell them what they're going to do yeah. and provide like a framework for the future. That make that's a lot of work. Yeah, when someone's a lazy fuck. <laughs> if, if you're, if <laughs> you're so. just kind of half-assing your job and yeah. just showing up, and I'm not saying they are. Yeah, Who knows? I don't know. I don't know him. Also, they might have resented him for whatever their preconceived notions of who he is coming and, into this job. And they were. I'm, I don't know if all twelve of them. I think there's twelve. I don't. But I think they were all Democrat. Oh, those son of a bitches. So, I mean, he, obviously he's a Republican. He's, he's. They're this, all unpaid volunteers also. Unpaid, right. Unpaid volunteers. Yeah. And that's, I'm, I'm an unpaid volunteer on that council. It's like, you don't do this for money. You do it to make a difference. Yeah. But if they're going to be a volunteer, even if they're an unpaid volunteer, and if he asks you to have a plan, you should probably have a plan. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, otherwise, why, why, why the, are you doing it? Because yeah. I guarantee you there's someone out there that would have a plan. Yeah. And look, especially when it comes to something that's important as national parks and public land, mm -hmm. things that are like really dear and important to people. Yeah. This, this is something that, you, you, you know, you want to have whoever these volunteers are, if you're going to appoint them, you want to have the best ones for the job. Right. So asking someone to write a plan up and that's, if that's the only reason, see, it's tough because we don't have their take on it right well i've i read what they wrote and what did I, they write? they just said that he wouldn't meet with them and whatever so, so he wouldn't re meet with them until they did what he asked they didn't say that he told me that but that's what he said right yeah well that makes sense yeah i mean i'm kind of in his camp that's if we're looking at it 100 percent accurately yeah no I, and he told me face to face that's what happened so i mean you know, you can say, well, I don't believe anybody. I don't believe right. I don't believe what you just told me. I don't believe what you, at some point you have to be like, man, it seemed like he's telling me the truth and I believe it. And that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense that they would not want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. What have you been working on? Well, I'll check my email and go on Facebook <laughs> when I'm at work. <laughs> Sometimes I look at pine cones. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he, to me, he seems like hardworking, pretty demanding. Um, but he cares. I mean, he's in there trying to, so the secretary of interior before Zinke, I had no, I'm like, what? I don't even know what that is, you know? So yeah. that's what, that's what kind of involvement that person had in hunter in the lives of hunting people like me or fishermen. And so when I didn't even know who it was and t come to find out her name was Sally Jewell, who was Obama's appointee before Trump appointed Zinke. Um, so I like the fact that Zinke's at SHOT Show. He's had me out there. I'm on this council. There's at least I have a seat at the table to say, and I don't know, I might get kicked off this council. I might never get invited back because I'll ask him, so what's going on with this? But right now I have a seat at the table. So whatever, it's, it's, I, I consider that a win. At least I can try to find out and, and learn. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because everything that I've heard about him, that I've read in the media, uh, unless I'm reading like a hunting website or something like that. Yeah. Everything I've heard is like that it's a horror show, that he's bringing on all these trophy hunters, and there was an article equating you with being a, a trophy hunter, mm -hmm. and that th this council that he's put together is just this disgusting sort of justification for trophy hunting, yeah. and that they're only putting it together so that wealthy people can bring back their elephants that they shoot in Africa. Yeah, yeah, I've read that too. I mean, for me, and I'm not, you know, I've never killed an elephant. I've never killed a lion. Um, and every person, so even the people on the council that have, they do care about animals. They care, they're volunteers, just like on the parks um, advisory board. And they're, they want to make a positive difference. You yeah. know, I know every person on that. I don't know every person personally, but I know they care about the people of Africa. And that's why they understand how it works. They've been there. They've seen it. Um, the guys who I've hunted with there personally, awesome people, hardworking people. I, the the one guy on my last trip there to Tanzania, his daughter was in college, and he'd been a professional hunter over there for over twenty or thirty years, and she was going to college now, getting her degree. I mean, well, let's explain what a professional hunter over there is not what we think about it over here. What we think of over here, a professional hunter be a guy who hunts. Oh, and no, that's what he does yeah, for a living. Right. A he's, professional he's hunter a is there essentially a guide. A yeah. guide. Yeah. yeah. They call them PHs or professional hunters. So, I mean, because of hunting, he's able to send his his daughter to college. And I mean. And now that's gone. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, with I'm not most, saying every person, but a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah, and they're it's not getting any better because right now, so that policy, Trump said, well, we're going to review it on a case by case basis. So he didn't say. He didn't say, okay, it's legal. Now everybody can hunt and, and go and bring their trophies back. He said, we'll review each one on a case by case basis. So that still doesn't make it that good for a hunter because they say, well, I'm not going to book a hunt if I don't know for a fact I can bring my trophy back. Yeah. So it's not really that much better. Well, what, you know, just saying that freaks people out. Like trophy, like you're saying trophy, it's an animal. It's an animal's life and you're going to bring it back. Yeah. You it's know what I mean? Like that, that, just that distinction is one of the things that triggers people. Well, Trophy. So, I mean, I see heads on your wall right here. Yeah. That's a trophy. Yeah. But also you ate the meat of that elk. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's not like uh, you can't be both a trophy right. hunter and hunt for meat. They're, I understand that. But most people are not blink bringing back lion meat. No, they're not. Right. But they're, it's also not mutually exclusive to be a trophy hunter and eat the meat or on the elephants. Those none of that meat is going to waste on an elephant. That's true. That's there what people was, don't understand. The there, elephants are actually, they actually taste good. There was a documentary. Allegedly. Just, yeah, I haven't had elephant. I mean, I've had, I've had crocodile and I haven't had lion over there. But uh, um, I, um, that meat is, I mean, the villagers that live there, man, it's, they, they need it. Yeah. And I, there was a documentary on CNN recently called Trophy. And I remember there's a scene in there where the hunter shot an elephant and it wasn't a big one. And the people were making fun of him for shooting. They're like, he's this small. They wanted a big elephant with lots of meat. Yeah. Okay. So he, he got his quote trophy. They wanted more meat. So it's like, you can have both. And that that's, I'll say trophy hunting because guys aren't going over there for the meat. I get it. I mean, that's not why you go to Africa. You're going for the trophy, but also that, that meat isn't going to waste. Yeah, the meat is going to the villagers. It's not like they're going to let it rot. And these people, I've seen it. I've seen videos of it. It's crazy. They show up with baskets on their head filled with elephant meat, and they're carrying around like 150 pounds of meat on their head. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really nuts when yeah. you watch these people just run in and get chunks of this elephant, and mm -hmm. they need it. It's it's really important protein for them. Yeah. They, I, the solution is very, very complicated. Africa is such an enormous place and the poverty is so intense mm -hmm. and the options are so limited yeah. for these people. There is, this is not like a simple, like ban the trophy hunting and the animals will live peacefully in the forest to tweet, tweet, bird, bird. That's not what's going to happen. Everything dies. Yeah. It's not just that. Everything over there is really complicated. And I always tell people to watch the Louis Theroux documentary. He did a, a thing on this hunting thing in Africa, and he was over there for a long time. And when he was over there, you got a sense, because he's Louis Theroux is a really fascinating uh, British documentary guy. Yeah. And, you know, he, he asks fantastic questions, and he's, he's really polite, and he, like, kind of pesters them yeah. over and over and over again until he gets to the heart of the matter. But at the end of the documentary, you realize, like, this is complex this is not as simple as hey these mean people want to go over there and kill animals and no. treat them as objects the whole place is kind of it's very very confused yeah like it's a it's a mess there's a there's a video right now uh, jamie could probably find it but so there's i think there's three hunters and they're over there i can't remember if they're they have bows and arrows or spears but what they do this lion kills an animal for them to get meat, they run in there and chase off the lion and chase off the lion and yeah. steal the meat. I've seen that. Cut, cut the leg off the, yeah. I can't remember if it was a wildebeest. I can't remember what it was. Cut the leg off of it and get out of there before the lions. Because lions, if you run at a lion, sometimes they'll be like, whoa, this, that's weird. And they'll back off. And then before they figure it out, they'll be like, wait a second. I can kill you. Then they'll, but in that in that hesitation time, they try to cut off that leg and get out of there. So, you know, when you're here in America making decisions for people like that, it's like uh, I got a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. You, what you said makes a lot of sense. That it's a first world perspective on a third world problem where people are literally starving to death. Yeah, they're, they're trying to figure out how to get they food need to survive. They need protein. That protein is like gold back there. Yeah, it's um, 
Yeah, this is it. This is the video, and this is on Discovery it. Channel. We can't show it, but oh. these people are running in. It's on Human Planet if you want to watch it. I think it's on Netflix or okay. a couple places. Yeah, it's pretty intense. So the lion, the lion's basically covered with blood. It's crazy. I mean, they, the lions just don't know what to do. They see these people walking at them with look like weapons, and they just take a chance and bolt. But what a fucking chance that is. Yeah. Yeah, so they got, those are bows and arrows, it looks like. Look at these things, man. I know. Just staring at them. Yeah. And they're super intense. What's that video? It's a title, Jamie. Just stealing. Oh, Human stealing planets meat. stealing meat from lions. Yep. Check it out. So, I mean, until, I, I, I don't I'm obviously not everybody's going to go do this. But you need to watch this just to get an idea of how rough it is. It's just, you know, the, the measures I'll take to get some protein. Yeah. I mean, that whole Cecil the Lion thing just created this uproar. If you steal to kill and nobody is hurt, that's when you can relax. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, there he goes. And with feel it. happy. He goes yeah. with a hindquarter slung over yeah. his shoulders. Yeah, and he's going to feed his family with and, that. And so to me, you know, hunters in, are vilified by a large majority of the population here, whereas we've said before 90, 96% of America eats meat. And hunters are the ones out there getting to themselves. And, like, I remember that last buck I killed um, in Lanai, Took care. I was like meticulous on taking care of that meat. And as I, I gutted the animal, as I took the bladder out, I can't remember how, what happened, but a, like a drop of urine dropped on a tiny little piece of the back ham. And I was just like, what? I was not happy. And because that meat is, to me, it's everything. It's everything for the hunt. And I was so disappointed in myself. But I mean, obviously the meat's still good, but that I, I, I want to be perfect when I'm when I'm right. taking care of it. Meanwhile, there's people that eat, 96% of people eat meat, and we throw away what's been, what's been figured 40% of our food goes yeah, in the trash. food waste is insane in this country, and I think Anthony Bourdain just did a documentary on it, right? I don't think it's out yet, but he did a documentary on food waste. So I'm worried about one little tiny piece of meat on an animal I killed, and people who throw away 40% of of what they buy into the garbage, they're judging me. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that out there, man. It's, it's real easy to be negative, you know, and that's one thing. Like, like I said about, put up my post about Lanai, I just uh, saw like a couple of negative comments. I'm like, I'm not even reading this stuff. Like, go have at it, folks. Wait. Just how, walk away. How did, so, you, how did you know what they said if you didn't read them? Because I put it up and I saw it immediately afterwards. You re so you read it. I read like a half a second of it. <laughs> but my point is, that people will be negative yeah because it's easy to do because they're douchebags well they don't even look they're not even thinking it through no. it's like yeah hey, you fucking just like killing animals people like to just make a statement or get a reaction or push a button yeah. or fuck with you yeah they want they want a reaction yeah. that's all it is so you can do one of two things you could ignore it you can Inter interact with them and argue with yeah. them back and forth. You could block the comments. Yeah, you know, all those things are kind of fucked. Yeah, just it sucks. It's uh, I've I've, God, I've been pretty frustrated. I've, whatever. I'm not gonna say I don't read them because obviously I read them, but I get frustrated. Man, it's just uh, hunting. I don't, people just don't understand hunting because even hunters will say, I'll say I don't enjoy the kill. And I don't enjoy the kill. I enjoy um, getting meat that I can feed my family myself. You don't enjoy the kill in that. It's the not actual like, kill. yeah, this is awesome. But it is like, huh, it's a relief. It feels good that your hard work paid off. It feels good that all the ethical consideration that you put into making a perfect shot yeah. is all worked out. And the amount of work that's involved in making you know, a 70 yard shot, mm -hmm. 70 yards is a long fucking way to hit an animal perfectly yeah. and then to have it die in seconds right. and then to get that meat. There's an enjoyment that comes out of, there's a good feeling, but it's not like uh, it's not, shooting a three pointer at the buzzer to no. win the championships and everybody's jumping up no. in the air. It's not, it's not fun. People will say, well, hunting is killing is fun. It's like, no, it's not fun. No. It's not, for me, it's not fun at all. I, I, I killed two bucks, made two perfect shots. They went, um, 
not far or down in seconds. And that was a huge relief to me. That's, yeah. that's why I do what I do every single day. And like I said, I posted on to be merciful and I don't enjoy when I'm not as perfect as I want to be. And I, I killed a bull last year in Colorado. I was with Johnny Hamilton, which, you know, Johnny, and he was back cow calling here. This bull comes up the hill. He stops at 15 yards and I hit him perfect, I, right behind the shoulder, it, perfect. He ran down, stopped at 30, hesitated again. I already had another arrow on, boom, hit him right beside the first first hole. And I'm like, that bull, I was so convinced he was down. And I was just like, oh man, that, that felt good. Got two in him, perfect, through the lungs. He's gonna be done in seconds. He wasn't done in seconds. And I, have no, I don't know what happened. Um, it, it, whether it was testosterone because he's coming off the hill, he's bugling, he was super fired up. So I don't know what was going on, but I ended up, um, it wasn't a, as quick a kill as what I have in my mind, what I prepare for, what I'm happy accepting. And that, and Johnny knows I wasn't happy. I was just like, I was so disappointed. How long did you stay alive for? Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe 20 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. How's that possible? I don't know. I have no idea. They're so tough. They're, and it's, that's incredible. Now I, w it really bothered me. It, 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 uh, it upset me. I wasn't, I was disappointed with myself. I was disappointed. But there's nothing you could have done better, right? I didn't, I don't know. I don't think But if you made a perfect shot, I felt like it was perfect, but you know, if it's perfect, the animal's dead and in 10 seconds right so i don't know but when i watched it i've killed a lot of bulls i've went through the process a lot i would take those two shots on any animal any time and feel 100 percent confident he was going to go 50 yards um this that was bull, something that i was really concerned about when we filmed that under armor hunt in uh utah yeah because i was like man this is going to be on video this is you know it's a yeah big animal you know, it's it's a it's a big deal. I want to make sure that this thing, that it's a perfect hit. Yeah. You know, and so the feeling of relief that I got when I saw that it was a perfect pass through and that the arrow it was bleeding on both sides yeah. in the exact spot I wanted to hit. Yeah. And to watch him wobble away like on very unsteady legs, walk to about twenty thirty yards, and then tipped over. Yeah. That's an amazing feeling of relief, but it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. It's not like, fun. Yeah, no, it's not fun. No, there's a feeling of like accomplishment, but also of remorse. Yeah, and they're tied in together. Yeah, it's uh, um, and for the animal, like with a bow, with a perfect shot, you know, on on these bucks that I killed, they didn't know I was there. So it was just, I know they didn't feel. It wasn't like there's a a rifle report and bone shattering and they're dying from trauma they're dying from hemorrhage like your bull in utah that took off his legs were wobbly because of blood pressure he had a blood pressure loss because of hemorrhage that's not painful you know um and so that's that was a perfect scenario that's what we prepare for yeah. and that's that's our goal and when it doesn't work like that that bothers me and so when people chime in on, on your page or or on my page and these uneducated comments trying to trying to tell me how I feel or why I do what I do, man, that does not make me happy. No, but I understand it's the ability to comment on things is a very strange thing because the ability to talk to people is very different. It's very difficult to have an audience to sit in front of someone that, uh, you know, pick a person a famous like morgan freeman to sit down across i don't know why i picked morgan freeman but it's very Donald hard Trump. To, it's very hard to be in front of him yeah to, to be able to sit down and talk to someone and to look them in the eyes you would choose your words properly and you would mm -hmm. have a conversation but if you just like what's on your face bro like you could just what's all those black spots on your face you dumb fuck you yeah. just put that on twitter right and it's easy it's yeah. easy. The yeah. And that's so it's a human being communicating with another human being and saying something insulting. And it's so incredibly easy to do. Yeah. It's too, it's too easy. Yeah, we I think don't, so. we don't really understand what we're doing with that. And yeah. when it comes to hunting, there's something about the fact that 90, I think it's 97% actually eat meat somewhere in the range. And 
maybe 3% do it themselves. Mm -hmm. 3%. Like, what, right. do you, what do you think it is nationwide? If you had to pick nationwide, like, how many people nationwide uh, kill their own food? Is it even 5%? Uh, okay, well, there's... I know because I looked this up because I was curious at how many people I'm reaching on Instagram. So there's 13 million licensed hunters. 13 million. How, 13 million. How many? Isn't there 300 and some? How many people are in America? I think it's 320. Is it 320 somewhere in the range? 320 million? Yeah. So what is that? Under 5%? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a lot. It's a very small amount. And how many of them are only eating that? How right. many of them are, are, are spending so much time hunting that they can live off of the meat that they kill themselves yeah. only? No. So it's Jeez. one, maybe 1%. Right. That's not why even. I saw people, like, we had the picture of your freezer back here full, filled with meat. And they're, like, you know, saying, you couldn't eat that. I thought, you you know, you were just killing what you need to eat. But... So that's just some people. First of all, those people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. I do eat it. I eat all of it. And I'll, I'll go through that whole freezer in a few months. Right. And I give and it away to a lot of my friends. That was the key is uh, that I was going to say is every guest that comes, you ask if they want game meat. And they Brian take Callen, this. that fucking mooch, he comes over here constantly. He's like, okay, I need more steak. Yeah. I need more meat. Yeah. Well, um, have I give you it seen to his, a lot of my friends. Have you seen his body? He's Needs jacked. He's no, he's feed jacked. That monster spot. Yeah, right, right. Yes, <laughs> he's a beast. So I, I, was, I thought he ate steaks like all day, every day. He, if you ask him, he'll say he does. <laughs> I eat elk. Yeah, well, um, his quads. Yeah, all the everything, <laughs> whole, top to bottom. But uh, I mean, I, I give meat away to a lot of my friends, and well, they love it. It's, it's like it's fucking hard to get elk meat. Where are you going to get it? You well, know, I see a lot of people send me messages that they want to know what this whole elk meat thing is about. So they, they want to be involved. They want to know how, where can I buy elk because they don't yeah. hunt or they want to start hunting. But uh, yeah, one th that's what we talked about when we loaded up my deer in your freezer Yeah, to freeze it is that, you know, hunters are providers. It's That's a, a big... Um, it feels good to be able to give people it, meat and that, food. To me, it's, it's everything. Yeah. It's either to feed my family or to give my friends or not my extended family meat that I've harvested. Yeah. That is, that's every, for, to me, that's as good as it gets. Yeah, I had uh, Michael Hunter in the podcast recently. He's the chef that runs that restaurant Antel, uh, Antler in Toronto, and they're getting protested yeah. by vegans. Yeah. I gave him a bunch of meat, and he cooked it and put it up on Instagram. Yeah. And, and he was like, this is so awesome. And it made me feel so good to like look at these delicious meals that this guy prepared, who's a professional chef yeah. with meat from an animal that I killed. No. I, I give away a lot of that meat, but I eat it every day. Do you? I eat almost every day. I eat some sort of game meat. Yeah. If I'm home, that's what I eat. Yeah. Well, you know? we, ate a, we ate a bunch in Lanai. I know yeah. that. And yeah. those, what are those sticks called? Oh, the uh, what uh, Bob the Butcher makes. He calls jacks. them Axis Jacks. Axis Jacks. Yeah, he God. makes like a... It's like pepperoni. Yeah, like a pepperoni out of uh, Axis deer. It's sensational. Yeah. Sensational. He's a really good butcher, too. Like what he's done with all the cuts and labeled them all, and he gives you an envelope that has all of the recipes of how you should cook each individual cut. Yeah. It's awesome, man. Like, yeah. It makes me feel... Look, I never saw any of this when I was a kid. I grew up in the city. I never... I used to fish... I used to eat fish that I caught, but I never was involved in hunting at all until I was in my 40s. So when I, you know, I see comments from people that probably grew up the way I grew up yeah. and they don't get it. They never, yeah. they're never involved in it, but yet they're eating meat. And it's just, it's because no one's holding them in, accountable for what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And because it, it's easy to say, oh, you got a little dick. You want to kill oh that animal because you got a little dick. <laughs> so dumb. It's so common. So dumb, though. Can you imagine if that's what it meant, like if you have a little... If you have a little dick, you just want to go out and kill. There'd be a lot of death out there. There's a lot of little dicks. Maybe we should show them just to prove yeah. prove they're wrong. I don't, I don't want to show them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's look at that uh, bear attack. The selfie oh, bear attack. Oh, poor bastard. We forgot to do that. Well, that was one of the weird things that we were talking about. How, warning, graphic content. Oh, man no. mauled by bear while taking a selfie with it. Go full screen in this, oh, please. Oh, my God. This stupid fuck. So, this bear apparently was injured. And this dumbass in India decided he was going to go and take a, a selfie with it. Oh, he's hitting, oh, he's hitting it. it. Oh, you stupid fuck. I don't Oh, no, it's got the guy. That's why. Oh, it does? They're, yeah, they're hitting oh, it because it's got the guy. He, he's already fucking this guy up. God. 
So there's a bear in India? Yeah, they have oh. bears. Oh, look at it. Ooh. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's not good. No. That's. Oof. He's almost free. Look. That guy's got shitty jujitsu. Oh. What he's got to do. Oh, see, look at that. Right there. You're free, bro. You're free. Oh. Oh, it's tearing his hand apart. That Oof. is brutal. Okay. You got to shut this off. That dog's, the dog's, the dog's like, bark, 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 bark. Oh, man. That's. Yeah, that's a shit way to go, folks. Oh, God, that looks terrible. Yeah. Why don't, does no one have a fucking gun? Does no one have a knife? Does no one have a baseball bat? You can go and clonk that fucking thing in the head. Nobody's doing anything. Yeah. They're like, it's over. We've lost oh, him. Wow. Yeah, is that the bear? Or That's the bear? Is that what it says? I don't know why they would show it afterwards. <laughs> eh, it just says what a bear looks like. <laughs> yeah, that's... It's just some stupid video of a bear in a zoo. Yeah. yeah. Um, bad. Wow. Bad to take pictures with bears. It's a real common thing in Yellowstone. They have a real issue with that, where people yeah. try to get real close to bears to take selfies with them. I've done that before. Well, I think it's different. <laughs> you've done <laughs> it while, while bear hunting. Yeah, I did. But you've only done it with... Black bears. Yeah. Like, you never turn your back on a grizzly like that. No, 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 no. But in black bear, it's still... Still not I'm, safe. I'm not going to say it's smart at all. It's definitely not. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, you can read bears. Bears have uh, personality or attitude. Just like dogs. Yeah. And yeah. so it's, uh, if there's an aggressive bear coming in, probably not going to turn my back. And Yeah. I have one dog that I will let my kids... Do. That my my mastiff, my kids could ride that dog. They could yeah. do anything. That dog is a loving dog. He right. loves everybody. Yeah, you know. And then I have another dog that's a Shibu Inu bulldog. I don't let anybody fuck with him. Yeah, he's the littlest dog too. He's an asshole. Oh, like if you like try to get him to get up and get out of the house in the morning, he'll growl at you. You're like, listen, motherfucker, come wow. on, go outside. Yeah, it's time. Yeah. What are you growling, bitch? I'm like, come on, man. Uh. I've had you for 14 years. Get up. Go out. He's just old and yeah. it's he's in pain a lot. Yeah. He's um it's really hard for him to get up. But the point is, the other dog, I'm sure he's old too, but he just he's a sweetheart. He's got no aggression in him towards people. He's just right. a sweet, sweet dog. Right. That's just personalities. Bears yeah. are just like that. Yeah, there's some are. bears that are cunts. Yeah, there's actually there's a petition out there about um ban or I don't know, something about me, but it says I took a selfie of a bear then killed it, which is false. The bear I took a selfie of, I did not kill because it wasn't old enough. Yeah. So just to dispel any rumors. Well, those petitions are fascinating. You know, I mean, people don't want you to kill bears. Here's the thing. People don't, they won't, don't want animals to die. They don't want you to kill animals. How do you feel about animals killing animals? Because if you don't want animals to die, one of the best ways to stop that is to kill bears. Yeah, But if you kill bears, they get more angry at you for killing bears, mountain lions, and lions than anything else. Maybe elephants, which don't kill anything. Total herb herbivores. They kill people. Elephants do occasionally. Yeah. But mostly when people do something stupid, like fuck with them. It's not, they don't go out of their way to kill people. I think they do. Nah, I doubt it. I think, I I think they kill people if people are just where they, they want to go. I'm like, hey, asshole. Get That's the fuck killing out of them. Way. How about you get away from the elephant? But... <laughs> You know, the, the problem with that is, like, if you're growing crops, like we were saying, and yeah. the elephant starts eating your crops, you're like, get out of here, and the elephant's yeah. like, oh, excuse me? Yeah, stomp. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a wrap, kid. Uh, elephants can be aggressive. They can, but they're also fucked with constantly, and, you know, there's just something, to me, I like elephants. Yeah. I think they, no, they look awesome, them. they're cool, I'm Who glad they're, like they're real, me I know too. they're smart, I know they have, like, tight bonds in their community, and you don't have to kill one of those to eat it. I mean, it's like there's plenty of other animals to eat. Mm -hmm. like, I just, but if I was starving to death and I was living in a place that only had elephants, for sure I'd kill an elephant. Yeah. I mean, if that was all I had to eat, our friend Brian Stevens said it tasted delicious. He said yeah. he ate one in Africa. Did he? And he said it was is like one of the most delicious steaks he's ever had in his life. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, what? Like, yeah. how is that possible? Endangered elephants and tigers kill a hum one human a day in India as growing See? population squeezes habitat. Yeah, but this is a crazy situation, man. India is fucking so overpopulated. It is a very, very small place. What is he doing? I'm trying to get over that fence. See oh, that? he's tearing apart that car. Look a at that shit. A thousand human deaths since 2014. Wow. So they kill people. A thousand human deaths in four years, whilst tigers have killed 92 people in the same period of time. So elephants kill Whoa. way more. 
Whoa, that's nuts. At the end of that uh, bear selfie thing, it said two other people were killed in that state in India, and they were both trying to take selfies with elephants. <laughs> Fucking dipshits. Huh. One was a kid. There's too many people in India. I mean, India is grossly overpopulated. Mm -hmm. India, I think, is smaller than the United States, right? Isn't it? Like, what size is India? I don't know. I think it's smaller than the contiguous United States, but it has a billion people in it. Yeah. Like, not slightly more than one-third the size. Oh, more than one-third the yeah. size. Okay. Yeah. A billion is a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of fucking people. Yeah. So they get tri triple what we have and a third the size. Yeah. No, yeah. A, a third larger. Oh, I, that's no, what you're saying, right? It says it's slightly more than one third the size of the USL. Yeah. Oh, so it's a third. Yeah, yeah. A third our size. Yeah. I thought you were saying a third larger. That's what I no. thought I was saying too, but I just no. I, I reread it and it. Oh, yeah. so that makes sense. So okay. it's a, a third of us, but has three times the people. Fuck. It's half the size of Russia. Oh my god. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, a like, human a day fix, is killed. That's crazy. How do you fix that place? You know. Yeah, that's that's part of. Um, I don't know. There's Africa is some places in Africa. Also, they I, I know that because uh, malaria medicine is good, people aren't dying from AIDS. There's uh, a wow. lot of people. Oh, that's how India. big is India compared to the USA? Look at this. India fits right in there. Yeah. My favorite is how big is Africa? Go to how big is Africa? Because Africa is hilarious. Look at that. USA, India, China, yeah. Eastern Europe. Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Netherlands, Belgium, Portugal, and Japan, and Great Britain all fit inside of Africa. Fuck, that's big. Yeah, it's a big area. Fuck. Yeah. That Af is crazy. Africa's amazing, though. Man. That's crazy. When you look at that on a map, you, yeah. you're like, like wow. Yeah. The Congo is as wide as America is. Just the Congo. Mm -hmm. The mm. true size of Africa. Man. So when I, and someone says like elephants are endangered in Africa in some spots. Some spots. In some yeah. spots they're overrun. It's just like yeah. grizzlies are endangered in LA. They are really endangered in LA. Unless you go to these certain bars in Santa Monica Boulevard, <laughs> oh, they God. have bears for days. Oh no. I you know, uh, I didn't know that was a gay reference. <laughs> Until recently. <laughs> Who have you been hanging out with? Not gay people, I guess. You don't hang around. You just, you got to just read. Oh. Read on these you things. You don't have to hang out. No, no, you don't have to hang out with them. <laughs> you don't have to actually go there. Like, I need oh. to know guys about gay. Well, take your pants down first. If you want to get show in the club. <laughs> uh, hey, speaking of, I don't know what we're speaking of, but how, we need to talk about Kanye. Just oh, yeah. oh, Jamie's got crazy <laughs> Kanye conspiracy theories slash conspiracy. theories. Yeah. Well, first, so first of all, he's like he came out for Trump recently, sort of. He wore a Make no, America Great Again yeah. hat on, but he also called Trump a bald thief. What recently too? He did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he called him a, a bald crook or a bald thief. I think thief. Kanye is a lunatic. Yeah. So I could care less what he says about Jamie anything. Jamie loves him. Jamie sleeps with a picture of Kanye <laughs> under his pillow. Stop. <laughs> Stop. No, I don't. People, people believe think, that shit. You think people believe that? Yes, Come dude. on. People believe everything you're saying about me. It's not a. It's it's a, it's a pendant with a picture well, with his picture on, in it. Jamie's right? a big fan of two things: nuclear weapons <laughs> and Trump. He's study. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Uh, he loves nuclear bombs mm. and he loves physics class. Yeah, and so Trump. I was just in one before. <laughs> <laughs> here's 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 what I like. I I well, Kanye's a lunatic, but I do like Candace Owens, who is also new on the scene in my Fox News world. You love that. I love you yeah. love conservatives. Well, and Candace is just like she. I walked in from work the other day, and I was like, started listening. Fox News is on, of course. I'm watching. I'm like. Who the hell is this? You say Fox News is on, of course, because yeah. Fox News is just blaring <laughs> propaganda through your house all yeah. the time. Do yeah. you ever switch it up, like have like CNN on in the bathroom no, no, and I Fox do. News on in the I, living room? I, I watch it all. I, I do watch CNN. Alex Jones says, tune in at 1.30 p.m. to watch InfoWars exclusive on Candace, Candace and Kanye. Now, oh, see, oh, I don't like exclusive? I yeah. don't. It didn't happen. Every, he was, <laughs> it's like a lie. What is he going to say? Featuring Candace and Kanye? Two days so, ago, yeah. 
I don't want to lump them in together. But is he talking about them? He was supposed, everyone thought they were going to be on his show together. Oh. Oh. It didn't happen. Right? InfoWars exclusive. I he could, probably called them. Kanye, it's Alex Jones. I could care less what Kanye says. I like what Candace says. Well, Jamie thinks that all this wackiness with Candace Owens and Kanye is really Kanye just getting people hyped up about the release of his new album, which will be out in a few yeah, months. Yeah. So he's getting people fired up. You think that's what's happening, Jamie? Yeah, there's a internet conspiracy that's been like not proven because mm. it can't be proven yet, but uh, there's a long Twitter thread and a few like reports now on blogs or magazines, if you will, that sort of leads to like an Andy Kaufman-esque type performance art piece that he's doing that maybe... Uh, bring up a conversation about some of these topics he's actually talking about, or mm. maybe we'll find out when the when his album comes out. If mm. Kanye is doing performance art, then what's the point? Here's the uh, here's the problem. There's a certain amount of him that is undeniably insane, yeah. and um, you've seen that like that thing that Jimmy Kimmel mocked, where he had that little kid. He used to do little kids saying things that Kanye said. And like he would have like oh really yeah like he would have little kids I saying hate exact, Jimmy Kimmel by the way hate him I hate he's him. a nice guy no you met him you like him I no, like him I a lot I would he's like he, he cries about hunting what did he cry about lions sea salt yeah he, I don't know why maybe he he's on medication he <laughs> sometimes guys okay. take things and it ups their estrogen and they just get real watery oh my. yeah that, I cry when people do really well that I feel like a bitch sometimes. <laughs> I cried when Conor McGregor was talking about the support he gets from Ireland. I had to hold back the tears. Did you? Being honest. I was being honest. No. I was interviewing him, and he started talking about the love I get from these people from Ireland. I'm like, God, that must be amazing. Uh, that actually... <laughs> yeah. No, I, I get that. I get that. <laughs> That's different than Jimmy, uh, though, crying, like, drumming up stupid stuff for Cecil the Lion. Yeah. The lion thing is weird. The lion thing is weird. You know, there was a great article that was in the New York Times in Zimbabwe, We Don't Cry for Lions. Right. It happened right after that. Yeah. And this guy was talking about his family members that were killed by lions. And yeah. We have a very idealistic view of what a lion is. And I'm, I'm a big fan of lions. I love that they're real. I love that they exist. I love that you yeah. can see videos of them. One of my favorite documentaries of all time is a documentary called Relentless Enemies. And it's about these this one pack of lions that got... A river changed its path, mm. and they got stranded on an island. Mm. And this one pack of, of lions grew enormous because all they have to hunt is water buffalo. So instead of this variety of different game animals, all they have to hunt is these huge 2,000-pound yeah. animals. So they grew jacked, like Hulk-sized lions, where the female lions are as big as a regular male lion. Really? It's wow. a fucking amazing That's documentary. That's protein. See if you can find some images from it. The way they look is just jacked. Mm. They're so muscular. They're fucking huge. Like female lions, 600 pounds. Really? Wow. Fucking amazing. But the documentary is incredible because these water buffalo are so big and so hard to take out. Cape that they buffalo. need like Oh, it's Cape Buffalo. Cape, yeah. So they need like six or seven of them. Just jump these oh, yeah. fucking buffalo and those, drag them to the ground. But those because, things are solid muscle too, yeah, Cape Buffalo. Yeah, they're, they're giant. But because of... And this, I believe this is over the period, I think it's a short amount of time. Is it in these Africa? Things, yes. Mm. A short amount of time that these lions have lived on this one island. Okay. But they did a whole documentary about it. Wow. Because all that's on that. this island are hyenas, Cape buffalo, and lions. Mm. And a few birds and a few others. So there's nothing else for them to eat. They don't want to eat hyenas. Yeah. Imagine what a hyena steak tastes like. Awful. I wonder what it tastes like. Awful. What if they taste great? Maybe, Imagine I mean, maybe. pigs. You look at a pig, you're like how could that taste good? Yeah, I guess, I don't know. Wild they, pig is fucking delicious, and they look disgusting. In Africa, they say hyenas are uh, wh witches. Witches. Well, they seem like it. they're laughing at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. And then that was a that was a whole thing. It's like a, an alpha female has a dick. Remember that? Yeah. It's not cool. No, it's bigger oh, dick than males. Thing. So. Jimmy Kimmel also made the small penis reference about hunters. What is this? It's the Okavango Delta oh. Lions from Planet Earth 2. Yeah, you can't about. really tell yeah. in that picture. See, uh, go, do um, 
Google uh, enormous lions, I'd, relentless enemies. This is as close as I could get to. Yeah, mm. I know there's video on it. You can get. Well, yeah. So I said it's on Planet Earth Two or that relentless enemies doc. And I can't show that. Right, right, right. But this is Planet Earth Two. But the the documentary is just relent. Just Google relentless enemies documentary. Wait. So this is this area where the the lions are stranded mm -hmm. in this one particular, and it's not a very large spot. But in this one place, yeah, there it is. It's really fucking awesome, though. Oh, that must be it. Yeah, dum dum dum. See if you get some good images of how big these things are. You can't really tell. They just look like, oh, oh ew, banging. you're watching sex. <laughs> Why watching them bang? Go to the second one, not that one, but go back to the uh, that page. The, the second one, Relentless Enemies, Lions and Buffalo. This is the one. Oh. So this is so this is the the actual documentary. And there's also a pride of lions that are regular size on this island too, which is really confusing to biologists. They're like, well, what the fuck? Can't yeah. really tell yeah, here. Yeah. But see how jacked these females are? Yeah. It's tough to tell here. But here, they're, they're trying to take out this Cape Buffalo. Look at this. This is crazy. Yeah. They're all piling on it. Yeah. But the females are much, much larger than a regular female. It's pretty brutal. Hey, man, evolution. It's fascinating shit. Oh. Watching things struggle to survive. Yeah. Hard yeah. out there for a pimp. Death is never pretty. No. But I mean, the thing is, people would have a really hard time if a person was doing any of the things that lions do. Yeah. I mean, you would think that would be awful. But do you have a hard time with lions doing the things that lions do? You say no, because that's natural. Yeah. Okay, well, do you realize that the only reason why people even exist is because people did what lions do? Yeah. The difference is humans have compassion. Yeah. So, I mean, um, animals, there's no, they don't have time for compassion out there. You yeah. know, I mean, it's a uh, it's non-existent concept. I put up this video on my Instagram. This zebra had just a zebra foal had just been dropped. Um, it was just barely standing wobbly legs. This lion, big male lion walks up to it, kills it. Like it'd been alive minutes. Yeah. I saw that video. That's life. That bummed me out, but not as much as the one where you sh you had, was it a moose calf or an elk calf? Elk calf, where the yeah. bear was eating it alive and it's screaming out and its mother is just a few oh, feet away trying sucked. to figure out what to do. And that grizzly is just tearing it apart. That sucked. But, but meanwhile. That, that's what they do. If you don't control the populations of grizzlies, that happens all the time. And it, even today, right now, with the, just the populations as they exist right now, in places like Alberta, they estimate that 50% of all moose, elk, and deer calves are killed, or yeah. fawns, yeah. are killed by bears. They just, they just tear them apart. Yeah. Half of them. And that's, that's what happened up in British Columbia, because they did that. They did a vote in Vancouver, essentially, to vote on whether grizzly hunting should be allowed. Of course, people in the city, you know, just like here, don't think there are hardly any grizzlies left. So they said no, and so the the new um, I, I can't remember what the political party's called, but the one in control now said grizzly hunting is no longer socially acceptable. Yeah, and so they can't hunt them, and you'll see what's going to happen with the with the other animals. Well, they're going to have to hunt them, but they're going to hire people to hunt them. What, what what happens in those situations is what happens in California when it comes to mountain lions, and they mm -hmm. still get hunted, but they get hunted. In yeah. a very hush hush way, they right. hire assassins to go after these lions that kill dogs and cats yeah. and you know scare the shit out of joggers. And that's what they're going to have to do to bears. The, the problem with that hunt vote was the way it was explained. Gritty Bowman did a podcast about it, and mm -hmm. what they were explaining was that it was a very small percentage of people that even voted on this. Yeah, I mean, it was like just a few thousand people yeah. voted on yep. it, and most people were unaware of the consequences. Oh, That there needs to be a balance of these bears and these animals, otherwise the animals are going to get decimated and the bears are going to encroach on human populations. Right. And then on top of that, these bears, like that, the, there's been this whole business of guiding and outfitting for these bears and the biologists are not talking to the people that are actually in the woods on the ground about the, the population numbers. If you talk to people like my friend Mike Hawkridge, right. who lives up there, he's, he'll tell you there's a lot of bears. Mm -hmm. There's a, a large population of grizzly bears. And it's very difficult to determine what the actual population is if they're not listening to the people that are on the ground every day. Yeah, yeah. No, 
You got you to listen to the people that are in boots on the ground. But no one's, and when you have a vote on something like this, no one's taken into consideration these things. Like you're just going bears. Oh, why would you kill a bear? They're amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love I bears. Love, I love bears. The anthropomorphization of animals is one of the more dangerous things that people have done with civilization where we've decided that animals are like us. They're our friends. They have they wear baseball hats and fucking <laughs> ties. God, it's just weird. Yeah, it's it's a, and we do it from the time kids are little. You know, mm. you give them a teddy bear and then, you know, you tell them, oh, you don't kill real bears, do you? Mm. Like real bears are going to kill you. Do you understand what a bear is? Yeah. Like yeah. a bear is that thing with that guy in India. That's yeah, a bear. It's exactly. a monster. I yep. mean, it's an awesome monster. I'm glad they're real. Yeah, me too. But and bear meat is delicious. It is. And that's yeah. the other thing. It's like people think that somehow or another you can't eat bears. Like people get mad at you for killing a bear. Yeah. But they won't get mad at you for killing a pig because pigs are ugly. Like a wild pig. Like wild pigs or one of those one animals where vegans and animal rights activists don't have an answer to. Right. You know, they really they don't like seeing people shooting them out of helicopters. They don't like seeing people hunting them. But if you looked at the actual numbers, I would love to sit down, have someone from PETA or any animal rights activist group sit down with someone who really understands the wild pig infestation problem, mm -hmm. the, the, the invasive species that doesn't have a natural predator, that breeds three to four times a year, and can have as many as six to eight piglets in its litter, mm -hmm. and they're just just fucking like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. And they're having tons of them, and they're just destroying billions of dollars in crops every year. What yeah. do you do about that? What are you going to do? Tell me what to do, animal right people. <laughs> Tell them, they don't think about it because this is not an, a balanced, nuanced, objective mm -hmm. approach. They haven't looked at this whole thing. What they've decided is that killing sentient beings is bad. Speciesism is bad. You know that one, speciesism? I do. You're a species, I'm a speciesist. God. Everybody is when it comes to bugs. It's now, a fact. Everybody is at Subway. Hey, you want some bacon on that? Yeah, throw some bacon on there. Well, if you don't, if that's if you eat at Subway, bro. These everybody, vegans don't eat at Subway. Everybody doesn't eat at Subway. Vegans don't eat at Subway. Vegans at what? 3%? Yeah. What is the, the number of vegans? What's the percentage? 3%. What are the, yeah. What's the percentage of vegans that are cunts? Not, not, I almost said 30? 100. I almost said 30. 100, but not, not Wesley Town. No. I know He's, a lot of cool vegans. Yeah, me too. Ian Edwards. Oh, right. Ian Edwards is one of my best friends. Yeah. He's a big, he's a vegan. So there's two. Yeah. No, I, lo I know a lot of cool vegans, but there's a lot of vegans that are just super self-righteous. Like yeah. once, once they're on that team, they're super self-righteous. Yeah. And yeah. ask them how much time they have in the woods. Yeah. Not much. Hey man, how much time you have around bears? How much time you have? Yeah. Got a lot of time in the woods? <laughs> To form that opinion. <laughs> oh. Do you really understand? Yeah. Have you ever come across a bear tearing apart a, a cub? Oh. You know? Or, or, or uh, killing a uh, calf elk. Yeah. You know? It's, it's I mean, I, I don't even, when I put that up, I don't even like to watch it. I'm a hunter. I've killed a lot of animals. I don't like to watch it, but we have to show it. Yeah. How do you think they feel about animals killing animals? Do you think they feel it's okay because it's natural? I don't I know what they think. I wonder if it's just a convenient thing that they just look past. La, I, la, la, not listening. Yeah, la, 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 I think la, that's la. probably mostly what it is. Yeah, because if they really did want to, like, what is more beautiful? Well, that's objective. What? More, it's, what's more beautiful, a deer or a bear? I don't know, but I do know that one doesn't eat the other. Deers don't eat bears. You know, so if you like, if you, yeah. if you felt like they were both equally beautiful, you'd want to protect the deer from the bear. Mm-hmm. Man, I don't know. I, I know as a hunter, I people always ask me, well, "What do you enjoy hunting the most?" It's whatever I'm hunting. I mean, I'm, I, I respect and I'm drawn to all the. I like being close to all the animals, so it's, uh, it's. I don't really. I can't. I have a hard time rating them, personally. Well, for me, um, I just like the ones that are delicious, and they're all pretty delicious. The they ones are. That, are, that that we hunt. Yeah, they the are. The variety of it. I just like the fact, too, that I'm not getting meat from some fucking factory farm. Yeah. The people that are getting meat from the store and from Burger King that are still shitting on hunters and saying you got a little dick, like, you're being Come silly. On. You're but, being silly. No, I know, but I'm getting so... We've talked about this every single time, but the number of people reaching out is growing exponentially 
daily on who wants to be a hunter, who wants to provide for themselves and their family, and really sees the draw to that. And that is, it's the natural way. It's, it's uh, every day. Every it's also day. a concern people have, and the real good concern, for getting food that hasn't been tainted with antibiotics and hormones. Yeah. Getting natural food. There's no more natural organic food than an animal that is literally living in the wild until you take it out. Like, they don't even know you're there no. until that arrow hits them. The most perfect life up until that time, generally. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's the way it's meant to be, really. It's, you know, humans have hunted up until very recently. That's for, for most of our existence. Would you like to take Kanye hunting? If you do, if I'll you, take if anybody you, hunting. Would you take Kanye? I, I, where would you take him? Would, would it be I, bear I, hunting? Would I'd be take him bear. Thing? Just bear is good because you know it's like um, when we your first bow hunt was bear, just because it's it's pretty controlled. There's a lot of bear. Um, you, you can go on some of these hunts, and if you went on an axis deer hunt for your first hunt, you would quit. That's tough. You'd that's quit. tough. <laughs> so with bear, I think it's a good first hunt, and then I can I I like being able to explain why we're bear hunting the bear we're looking for we're looking for the big old male here's how you identify it i like being right there so if if i took kanye hunt hunting it would be bear hunting hmm um do you think he would be able to do it i don't know him i mean he's he seems crazy but i don't know is Kanye out there bear hunting? He just bought like 300 acres in Wyoming, so maybe he Did might he? be into it. Kanye bought 300 acres in Wyoming? He's yeah. probably going to build a sneaker factory out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good-looking country right there. That's gorgeous. No. Why did he buy 300 acres he's, in Wyoming? That's where he's filming or finishing his album right now. I think he fil or recorded part oh, of it. Here out we there go to with the out. album again. But I mean, hey, it's all, I'm telling you, it's all part of it. Do you work for but... Kanye? No. <laughs> Tell me the truth. <laughs> I do not. Jamie's, Jamie's got a side job. Yeah. But no, the, uh, I mean... He's also apparently building, like in the interview he talks about, I think he's building some houses or something out there. To, wow. To, to Can you imagine Kim Kardashian wandering around Wyoming? Oh. That, <laughs> that's when people are going to really want to get rid of the bear population because Wyoming's got some fucking grizzlies. Yeah. Imagine if the big grizzly bears take out the Kardashians. Well, I think, you know, I think people like, <laughs> jeez. Why I, are you laughing, Jamie? That's terrible. That would hey think stupid. about that. Think Why is it stupid? He's stupid. in Wyoming. No, it's like goofy, stupid. Like that's goofy. But he's in Wyoming. Think about the album sales. Go if crazy. Got, yeah. So yeah, if you like covered her with beef fat, be a fun horror movie. Send yeah. her out there in the woods. I think people like Kanye, and I don't know about Kim or, uh, but man, archery is a discipline people need. So I mean, they need I, some discipline. I, I think archery can be. It can be powerful. You know, I'd sent you that quote, I think yesterday about there's like a, there's things you do in your life where there's before you did them and after you did them. And there's yeah. a definitive line right there. I think archery can be a line like that where everything was before and now everything after. And it's that powerful. Well, I think difficult things are important for people to do. You know, I mean, I think uh, challenges are extremely important. If you don't have a challenge in your life, the, the human mind, you know, we, we were talking about idle time being the devil's playground yeah right if the the human mind needs challenges you need something yeah. that's stimulating and intriguing to you yeah. and bow hunting is insanely difficult archery forget about bow hunting if you just want to eat vegetables all day archery is insanely difficult mm -hmm. it's and it's something that requires concentration on all these different levels like mental concentration you have to focus on your posture and your form and make sure that everything's right yeah. the timing the release of the shot is right all that stuff requires so much of your focus and th so much thought that it cleans your mind. Yeah. It cleans your mind of all these other things, all the bullshit and the life stress goes away. When that arrow flies through the air and shunk, hits that bullseye, right. like it feels amazing. That's, that's one. I, I had a lot of respect for uh, Ryan Zinke when I went back there to D.C. because I, I took him a bow back there and there's a huge group of people standing around. He's shooting an arrow at a small target in a gymnasium. And, you know, I mean, you're putting, you're putting yourself out there because there's no guarantee you're going to be very good with the bow. Well, he doesn't have experience with it, right? No, no, not yeah. especially not with that bow. I think he shot one at the Western Hunting Expo, but I saw him shooting the air, like the, the arrow was lined up like you're shooting, 
you know, down his eye instead of with a sight. That's how they used to do it, right? Like a lot of like I saw some old pictures of Ted Nugent. He used to shoot a compound yeah, bow with a release with without a release. Oh, without. Well, I don't know if he used a release, but I know that he didn't have a sight. Right. And he was like looking down the the shaft of the yep. arrow. Yeah. Like a guy would do with a recurve bow. Yeah. yeah. Look, well that's not. That's no, that's not that that's one. in a good that, position. Maybe that that one right there. So that That's a little more. That's a little more. Yeah. Well that's it. That's a comp Well that's a recurve I think, isn't it? It's hard to tell cuz you're only looking at the top of the riser. But what is is that a recurve or comp? Yeah. I can't tell. Can't tell. But It says that. It says comp and the yeah, Ted Nugent is an irresponsible idiot. <laughs> oh God! So, <laughs> Jamie, why'd you pull that? Silicone one? Cowboys <laughs> blog. Uh, well, he's also got the bow canted sideways too. It's kind yeah, of weird. yeah, that's sort of how you do that. Yeah, see right there. Well, that's uh, he. He's got no sight on his bow. No there. sight. Yeah, he's yeah. looking down the arrow. So that's he, how he used to hunt. Yeah, he used to shoot with a tiny little stabilizer, no sight. And shoot instinctive. Yeah. And they ch switched it up a few years back and started shooting with sights. With sights. But, yeah. you know. But so anyway, so uh, Zinke was there, put himself out there. and Yeah, if he like hit the floor and it ricocheted off yeah. of the crowd. I mean, yeah. Stabbed somebody and, in the eye. Right. And so I I respected that. You know, you t you're taking a chance. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, that stuff like that is good for people. So, you know, Kanye included, man, if you want to shoot... A few arrows and kill a bear, I'll go. He doesn't have time for that, man. He's revolutionizing fashion. He's going to get people to wear dresses. Men are going to wear dresses soon oh, no. because of Kanye. That's what Jamie was telling me. Serious? Yeah. And then Kanye's going to start wearing dresses, and then other people are going to join in. Yeah. And he's selling flip-flops, and the, the bottom look like mountain boots. Slides. Slides. What? Is this Slides. all true? Yeah. 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 The, the dresses? I don't Whenever, know about the dress part. Yeah, if no. you want to have your p finger on the pulse of Ask what's Jamie. going on today with the kids... You got to talk to young Jamie Vernon. God, that's that's amazing. <laughs> he's yeah. a, he's my go-to liaison for what the fuck these kids are up to. Yeah. Hey, I'm a 50-year-old man. It's I don't know what the pay, fuck's happening. It's hard to pay attention to. It's hard to pay attention to everything. Yeah, that's you, for sure. Yeah, you I go to young Jamie. Yeah, that's true. I'm busy. I can't I can't keep up with everything. Well, and plus you're off social media now. Well, I'm not off it. <laughs> I posted twice today. <laughs> Did you think but, about getting the flip phone instead? No. Or you're like, no. I no, that. I have discipline. Right. I'm not like Ari Shafir. You heard me, Ari. He's got no fucking discipline. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, he talks about it. Like, he, if he gets his phone in his hand, like, he's like, I can't. He goes, I'll be late for everything. I'll be like 20 minutes late. I just, I just, I sit down. And I can't get off. He goes, I'm powerless. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I don't get that. That's not good. But I do know that not thinking about that stuff for three days made me feel better. You're, it was like a cleanse. Yeah. yeah. I think ultimately there's a, there's a tremendous amount of pressure in, in being in the public eye, like whether you're in the public eye on social media or public eye doing a podcast or anything like that. So for me doing nothing but bow hunting for six days like was a was, – it was a very difficult release Yeah. in that difficult, in a difficult task, not difficult, like uh, I needed to go back to it quickly. Difficult in that, like bow hunting is hard to do. Mm -hmm. So in doing that thing and concentrating on that thing only, I wasn't thinking at all about like yeah. Twitter or- You weren't distracted by yeah, stupid shit. Or the news. No, what I liked that last day, it was- uh, um, I loved, let's see, so I killed a buck earlier in the day. Um, you guys had been on some stocks. You came, drove down, loaded the buck up, took it to Bob the Butcher. And then we're, so it was, I think, later in the morning. Normally when it'd be like, okay, let's, you know, go get something to eat. We'll regroup and come back in the afternoon. But you're like, no, I, I want to keep hunting. You know, you were just so tunnel vision focused on hunting and it was so i was like i was so excited so we were out there and it was getting hot by this time and we we're just finding deer glassing deer putting together these stocks and uh, it was just like it, it was seriously one of i it sounds stupid i've said the best day of my life but i mean that's a perfect day for me it was fun it was it was it, you guys went down on that stock you and alec and then i found that that bedded buck by himself, the wide buck. And it was just like, man, 
What a great day. It was an awesome day, and that's how I would have done it if my family wasn't there. I would have just been doing it all day. Yeah. I wouldn't have come back. I would have just brought some snacks and water and stayed out. Yeah, yeah. I'm just one there to do, you know? It's, yeah. It's, and it's, you know, like I said, it's it's like a cleanse. Yeah. There's something about the, the difficulty of it, especially when I was doing it by myself. There was a time for a while where I was stalking on this buck by myself without Alec, without anybody, and, like, this is, like, it's, it's such a singular focus. Yeah. You're thinking about one thing. Yeah. You're just checking the wind, checking your range, trying to close in on him, putting bushes in between you and him so he yeah. can't see you, yeah. creeping, trying to, and, and it's, there's something about that that's so, it's so primal. It just resonates with your DNA. There's something about it where like, mm-hmm. you get, if you get one of those animals, and then as you're eating it, you're gonna remember that moment forever. You're I gonna remember. So. Yeah. I think it's a it's not just like getting something from a restaurant or from the grocery store it's getting some you're eating it's something got that a has, connection you have a massive connection to it yeah and that's i i videoed a little bit on that deer i killed that day and i put it on my instagram story just little clips about where i was where the buck was kind of the, the strategy taking off my boots and all that and so many people sent messages saying that that was fascinating and yeah. I, i'm like Man, is that I mean, still up? How long does the Instagram no, story I, stay up? I, I, no, but I saved it on the highlights. Okay. Oh, that one you saved? So, what is it listed under? It says Axis Stock. Oh, that's badass. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's people can check it out, and it's just like I was reading the comments and see, reading the messages, and people saying how fascinating it was and how educational. And I'm like, on one hand, I'm like that's awesome. On another hand, it made me feel bad for them because that's just I've done that so many times and it is, it's, it's powerful and it's, it feels like the way it should be, but I feel bad for people who haven't experienced that. Right. So I feel good for you now that you're in that. And then, but the people sending me messages, I, I'm like, I would love to almost be able to share that with them somehow or, or, I mean, that's as good as I can do right now. That's but one of the hardest things for people is to, to get in it. To get started. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like the learning curve. That's what I was going to ask you is, uh, You've been bow hunting now. What was that first bow hunt we went on? What year was that? 2013 or 14? 14? So four years? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so four years. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's what what what's changed from that first year to this year for you? I mean... Experience for sure. Yeah, having more hunts under my belt, understanding how little I really know. It's like one of those things. There's a there's a great expression that I think from Dennis McKenna that once the the bonfire of understanding grows, the surface area of ignorance is revealed. Right. right. Is that the bigger the bonfire, the more you realize. Like the more you understand, the more you realize how much there is to learn. Right. And that's one of the things about hunting. With each experience especially something like lanai which is so it's so difficult it's like the most difficult but i mean at least what i've experienced in my short amount of time doing it the most difficult kind of hunting spot and stalking things that are just fucking wired yeah super pressured the stock is the most difficult the i mean if you if you have to backpack in the mountains yeah, that's, that's a different kind of difficult. That's a different kind. Yeah. So the stock of these and getting a bow range and making the shot, yeah, that's yeah. it's almost as hard as it gets on the animals that I've hunted. There's some antelope in Africa that are just as quick. But um backpack hunting's probably the hardest yeah. physically, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a that's a whole different challenge yeah. Yeah. and a whole different knowledge base that you'd have to delve into, but as far as stocking and getting those killed with the bow, these axis deer, you're right. Also, like, I would imagine that backpack hunting in the mountains is also more mentally taxing because you can't just go back to the cabin. You can't just go back to the lodge. Nah. You're, you're out there in a tent and you're 20 miles in. And if you break your ankle, you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Or you're going to have to tape that thing up and crawl out of there. It's a little better now because people have way more access than when I started. When I it, there was just you would have to get to the top of the mountain to even get barely cell phone service if that was even possible. But right. now, you know, there's a lot Satellite of- Satellite phones. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people have access, which which is nice. Yeah. But still, it's, it's, uh, it's intimidating for a lot of people. Yeah, the barrier for entry is very high. 
Yeah. It's very hard to get started. And I'm just really lucky that I got started because of a podcast that I got to meet Ranella and yeah. got into hunting and then got to meet you and then got into archery and bow hunting and all that stuff. And, but it's for someone on the outside that's looking in, it's extremely difficult. No, but here's what you do. You go to a archery pro shop. Most people have those. I know there's one down here in San Diego, performance archery. Um, I met Scott Eastwood at one in Riverside. And I think it's called Riverside Archery back home. It's a bow rack, but there's these pro shops that that's what they do every day. So the key with any hunting, any archery hunting you're going to do is shooting that bow and shooting it consistently, getting those reps in. And that's where, you know, you, you can't control the experience you get, you know, it, you, that kind of comes slowly, but like what you've taken control of is the repetition and the discipline with shooting an arrow and doing it accurately. So once you control that part of it, the hunting experience is going to come, the stock experience, the learning the animals, that's going to come. But at least when you get that opportunity, you'll be able to make the shot. So for what I, for, for new people who are interested, get to an archery pro shop, get set up with the good bow, learn how to shoot correctly and do it a lot. And then you branch out and set up the hunts. It's just so difficult to execute a shot on an animal. Yeah, it way, it's, way different. People don't have any idea how much anxiety and how much adrenaline is pumping through your system when you're drawn back on an yep. animal. Yeah. I mean, the consequences are so grave. Everything is so high stakes. It's just, it's, and you only get this one shot. Like here it is. And especially say if you're on a back country hunt, you go 20 miles in, there's, mm -hmm. there's a 190 inch mule deer just standing there and he's feeding and you get this one shot. Yeah. This is your one shot. You've been, you haven't seen a deer in six days and you happen. finally see a deer and you draw back and your arms are shaking and you, you just try and trying to go through your shot process without flinching and fucking panicking and just slamming that trigger like it's a fucking door and a monster's on the other side of it. People want a shortcut and I was the same way. I'd been on hunts like that. I've been on um, Nate Simmons filmed me on a hunt where I was in the Eagle Cap wilderness and I don't I'm trying to or I'm trying to think if yeah, we didn't see God, I, don't, I want to say we didn't see an elk for something like six days. I killed a buck on day seven, I think, and a bull on day eight. But there was a long time in there where it was like, what are we doing? Yeah. So it's really easy when you finally do get that opportunity to want to shortcut from seeing it to holding the antlers in your hands and being successful. Right. And that's where people rush it. They get back and they just want to get that arrow on its way. Anxiety. Because the sooner an arrow can be going towards that animal, they feel like the closer they are to holding that animal, to making a good shot. But, man, you still have to go through. If you, you can't skip a step. Anxiety is a crazy thing, man. Yeah. It's a crazy thing. It's like that adrenaline and that the, the, the feeling of discomfort is like this like uncertainty feeling. Yeah. It's just very hard for people to handle, but that's with the case of anything where you have to perform, anything where it's difficult to do, where you're just like, oh my God, is it happening? It's happening right now? Wow! Yeah, The I brain know. is so, it's wired with all these different chemicals that are excreted when that, when that moment's happening, when, when there's a, this final event, this is it, here it is, oh my God, well, ready, action. That's where I think all the reps you've put in paid off because on that first buck so it was 15 minutes into the hunt it was even alec who's been doing that for 30 years has never had a hunt that played out that quickly that perfectly but i think you told me um i'm always i'm always trying to get into the to the heads of other hunters and and just want to know what the thought process is but i think you told me that when you're in bow range of that buck right out of the gate on the early in the hunt didn't you take a few deep breaths and relax did yeah. you say that yeah. yeah yeah and that's a lot of people they're tense they're tense because there's so much going on they never relax and that shot is just not going to be accurate yeah but when you can relax and then just like in your backyard you come you focus you're just as calm as you've done a thousand times and you can pick that spot level that bubble and slowly squeeze that trigger that's when it works. Yeah. That's super hard to do. Well, it was it was happening so fast that before we knew it, we, we kicked our shoes off and we were walking 
you know, just with socks on, yeah. just creeping through the grass. And we got to 45 yards and he's like, do you want to get closer? I'm like, this is perfect. Stop right here. Yeah. Like I got it. Yeah. And I just went, mm -hmm. just took a couple of deep ones Yeah. and it was feeding. And then I'm like, okay, I know what to do. And yeah. I just did it. And when, when the whack, when I, I heard the, the impact of the arrow, I was like, holy shit, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. That was a uh, perfect execution. Yeah. It's a weird feeling man when it's like did that really happen did that really happen then and we're that, standing over the, the the and then i sent you a picture of it and i said boom <laughs> yeah like I know. It's, and that was i say perfect execution not of killing the animal of the shot it's yeah. a perfect execution of the shot i'm not saying we, we're executing animals well, that's what people don't understand it's hard to do it's not there's so much physical action involved in pulling a bow back and being in perfect position and making sure you're not torquing the bow and leveling the bubble on the site and and pulling with the back muscles and making sure everything's in line and there's no flinching or extra movement and you're concentrating on the exact spot you want that arrow to hit as the thing's releasing all under extreme anxiety and pressure and this thing is it moving is it going to keep walking what's going to happen and there's so much involved but the feeling when it's over the relief and then knowing that I'm going to have this organic meat yeah. that is the most delicious meat in the world that I'm going to be cooking, and I can't wait to cook it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't cooked any of it, but um, I can't wait. I'm going to cook some tonight. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a it's a powerful experience for almost anybody, and it's one that I know not everybody can hunt. Not everybody who listens to this is, is probably ever going to hunt. But those that do will understand, you know, and it's not always going to be comfortable. It's not always killing an animal. It's not people aren't going to – have warm and fuzzy feelings about seeing an animal dead but they are gonna there's something about taking responsibility for the meat that you're eating yeah and that's gonna be i, I don't know if relief is a r right word but it's uh it's just the connection that i think they're gonna it's gonna make more sense well one thing that confuses people with you is when they find out that you run ultra marathons and you're working out all the time, like, why is he doing all that stuff? And like, why well, do that to be my very best when I'm in the mountains, when I'm hunting? People, I've seen people go, what? Mm -hmm. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You work out every day, you run twice a day, you run ultra marathons to test yourself so that when you're hunting, you could be at your very best. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I don't think people understand how much it means to me. Uh, I feel like I owe it to the animal to be at my best. I, I feel like if the animal suffers longer than, than I believe it should, that's, I don't like dealing with that. I don't like the, so I feel like I, there's a weight of that on my shoulder, shoulders where I need to be at my best as a hunter. And to do that, I put in work, I prepare every day. And I just want to know that I'm going to be merciful when it comes time to kill the animal. And well, you're also going to be in shape enough to get to position to get to the animal and have your heart rate drop down enough so that you yeah. can stay calm. Yeah. This is why you do so much cardio. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on this hunt, I felt all that worked out exactly how it was supposed to. Um, quick, very quick, clean deaths. And then, you know, like in the buck that I killed just a couple of days ago, that second buck, I was able to, you know, there's something about putting a, the, a dead animal on your shoulders and packing it out that, uh, you know, it's just part of the process. It just feels right. Yeah. But for a lot of people that seems so crazy, like, wait a minute, you run a marathon a day mm -hmm. so that you could be in shape to go hunting. Yeah. Can't you just go hunting? <laughs> you can. A right. lot of people do. And I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not here to judge anybody or tell somebody that they need to do what I do or they're doing it wrong. I'm saying that's what people that, you know, hunting is such a personal journey. You know, when people say maybe hunting is fun for some people, maybe for some people it is fun to kill an animal. I don't know. For for me, it's not. And people said, oh, you can admit it. It's fun. I'm like, it's not fun. It's like, I know what it means to me. What it means to me is I need to be at my very best. To be at my very best, I need to run a marathon a day. I need to work harder than I've ever worked. So I'm at the top of my game on the hunt. I don't care what you think about that, or I don't care about your mindset. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. 
And that's people have a hard time with that. Well, they have a hard time believing, first of all, that you run a marathon a day. Even you saying that, I'm like, imagine if I didn't know this guy. I'd be like, he's full of shit. Yeah, and no it's one not. Runs a fucking, you run a marathon, you're supposed to take six months off and do nothing. Uh, it's true. Isn't it's that what true. they say? Yeah, it's true. You know, it's, uh, man, you know, and it's not all at what time. It's what I do is I get up in the morning, I'll get six miles done, faster cardio. Uh, and people then people also like to to say why they don't do it is because well I spend time with my family it's like shut the fuck up I spend time with my family too so anyway you just I get up while they're still sleeping I, they're sleeping what am I supposed to do supposed to go lay in bed by them <laughs> wake them up <laughs> I want to spend time with you yeah wake yeah. up kids yeah so I go before anybody's up the second time I run is at lunch and I I got to get out of the office I got a regular nine to five job drives me insane because i'm meant to be in the mountains but hey i got a job it's the best job i ever had i'm i want to do a good job for the company i work for i've been there 21 years but to be at my best there i need a break at lunch so i say they said well hey do you want to be superintendent of the water department i'm like yeah i'll be superintendent but i'm going to run every day at lunch and if they would have said, no, nah, you can't do that, I'm like, well, I'm not going to be superintendent then. But they said, okay, yeah, you can do that. I'm like, all right, I'll come in early. I'll stay late. We'll make it work. So I, that's my second one. I can't spend time with my family at lunch. They're not going to come to my work and sit in the lunchroom with me. <laughs> so I go running. Um, and how far do you run at lunch? At, at lunch, I'll try to get if – I, if I'm trying to get a marathon done a day, I don't go to the mountain. I just go flat, and I get at least 13 done at lunch. So – Combine so you're at 19, 19. Yep. Before you even get home. So then the last run of the day on my way home from work, I'll go to the mountain and I'll get that last seven or eight done. You know, and that's <laughs> three free runs a day. And that'll be a marathon a day. That's a lot of fucking running. No, it's not. It, well, it's not for you because it feels you, fine. I don't feel, I feel a hundred percent healthy. I don't feel banged up. I don't feel anything. And, and that's the question I always get. Well, how do you, people say, well, uh, how, how do you, you recover? And how do you, ha why do you have so much muscle? First of all, I weigh 170 pounds. I'm not, I don't have like muscle everywhere. So I'm not big, but I also eat meat all the time, every day. You know, you talked about the lions and wherever with the river and they were eating just Buffalo and they were jacked. You got to have protein. So if you can run a marathon a day, if you're eating salad, you're going to weigh 140 pounds. Okay. Yeah. If you run a marathon a day and you're eating steak three times a day, you're going to retain some muscle. So that's what I do. I know what my body needs for calories. And I know when I'm at my best, it's when I have excess calories to, to burn. So that's what I do. I make sure I'm eating nonstop. But you're also lifting weights. I do. How do you have the time to do all this? I'm like listening to the schedule. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And then you shoot your bow. Yeah. And then you hang out with your family. Yeah. What in the so fuck, Cam Haynes? The, the, family, the family time is about from, let's see, I'll get home at about 6.30 till about, and then peep, everybody will be going to bed at 10. So that's Fox News time, <laughs> hanging out. And, you Fox know. News time. Is that all you fucking watch is Fox News? <laughs> well, in the evenings. That's really what you watch uh, at night. We watch The get Voice. Complained. God damn these liberals. We watch, you watch the, the Voice. The, no, or American. Luke's on the American, or on American Idol. Luke Bryan's on there. So I watch that a little bit sometimes. My daughter. So that's what me and my daughter do. She loves The Voice. And, uh, and so it's fun. It's fun right. to get into that. So that's what I do. And I can... If I'm just doing the close reps, like during the work week, it's generally just at my house, just, you know, 20 yards shooting my bow. And mm -hmm. that's, and it's just, and then when I'll lift on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I lift right after work and I'll go and outlaw strength. And, you know, sometimes Nick, the trainer, dude, hammer it out. I'll stick it home at the same time. So on those days, I'm not going to get a marathon done a day on those three days. Do you feel like shit on those days because you didn't get your marathon in? No, because lifting is hard. <laughs> and lifting is hard. But I, I, in the back, I, I'll be honest, I'm not normal. I get it. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I kind of suck a little bit because I didn't get a marathon done. <laughs> that is so crazy. Yeah. that that's What my, are you thinking? Like when you run an ultra and to say if you run 100 miles or more, when, what – what kind of demons are going through your head when you're out there running? Um, I don't. I don't know if it's. I don't know what it is. It's uh, like the Moab 240. You, yeah. ran, you ran 238 miles in three days. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking while you were at day two and a half? What I'm thinking is I'm 
I'm honoring myself by getting the absolute most out of my, I don't think I've, I've reached my limit. I think, I don't, I think if you're not getting the most out of your body, you're not, you're not taking advantage of your life. No, you're not honoring your life. So to me, I need to find what my limit is. I, I, I can't halfway it. I can't halfway it because I feel like then I'm not, man, that's not, I don't know. I, I can't live with myself if I, if I don't feel like I've, I'm give, I'm have given everything that I have. The weird thing about running is, like, as you run more, your capacity to run more increases. Mm -hmm. So you realize, like, oh, like, the, the body has more capability than you think because you just have to get it accustomed to this amount of work. And then you just do it all the time, and then it gets used to it, and then it grows, it expands, and then your threshold and what your expectations are, they increase too. Yeah. So in the beginning... You were saying that when you first started running, like running a 5K is like, holy shit, this mm -hmm. is hard. Or a 10K is brutal. You would never think like, man, can I do a marathon? Right. Now you're fucking doing a marathon every day. Yeah. And this is the same person. It's not like, you know, you, oh, I've always, first time I started running, I ran a fucking ultra marathon. You know, it's not that. No, 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 no. And that's, I mean, that's everything. That's everybody and everything you work up to it. Yeah. And. So that it's no different from me. I just feel like I'm finally getting to my potential mm. and I wasted a lot of years not living up to my potential. So I, I, when I do the running videos and I'm smiling, I'm in a good mood. That's genuine. Cause I'm like, this is my potential. Yeah. I can't be happy sitting at home watching TV. I'm going to do it because I love my family. I'm going to hang out and do that, but I can't be, I, I don't feel like that's my potential. This, this is the thing that I think is very important for people like you and I think a, a lot of people. It's that in achieving goals and in pushing hard, there's a release of anxiety that I think overwhelms a lot of people for most of their life. Mm -hmm. Most of, I know a lot of people that are overwhelmed by anxiety and most of those people that I know that are overwhelmed by anxiety don't push themselves. Mm -hmm. I think there's a connection there. Yeah. And I think that physically pushing yourself to your limit all the time, whether it's lifting weights or jujitsu or running or whatever you do that's strenuous, mm -hmm. I think it's a requirement for the human body that we think of as an option. I don't think it's an option. I don't think so. Especially not for mental health. I think I think it's really critical. I think I think really hard exercise is one and I don't care what you do, whether you're swimming or whatever you like, whatever you enjoy, mountain biking. Mm -hmm. But I think really hard exercise is one of the most important requirements for like a happy, healthy life. I really do. I think, you know, man, I could say that maybe I try to justify what I do to try to put logic to it. And maybe even what you're saying is, 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 a little bit of justification, I don't know. So I don't know if what I do is right or what we should be doing, I don't know. I just know how I feel when I do it. But that doesn't mean I don't have regrets sometimes, like even with my kids now that they're older. And uh, you know, I, I really struggled wondering if the message I'd been sending to my family about average is a failure. Um, if you're not giving your best, you're not honoring your life basically. And then I'm like, maybe that's okay for some people. Maybe not everybody needs to run a marathon a day and, and they're fine and they're happy. It's like, who am I to say what makes somebody else happy? Just like I get mad when somebody tells me how I should feel. Mm -hmm. I can't say why they need. And so then I was like, here's my kids, my boys who are great young men, strong, um, have all the potential in the world. Have I, some have I said, being just a regular guy who has a job and comes home, there's something wrong with that. And I'm like, God, did I screw up? And it's just like, that's really been bothered because my son quit a good job as a deputy, my oldest, and he joined the army because he says he has more to offer this world. That's hard. Is it hard because, well, it's hard, first of all, because your son is joining the military. And you're like, wow, my son could go to combat and mm -hmm. I could lose him. Yeah. But is it also hard because you feel like your high expectations for yourself might have set a bar 
for him mm -hmm. that maybe doesn't line up with his initial expectations you've made him think that whatever might have made him happy before is not good enough right and that yeah. I, that's what i thought and i you know i was like it, it was uh it was hard to deal with when he was leaving and i'm like god what did i do right and uh so you know i, I told him you know I, i'm sorry if i ever made you feel that that being a regular average person there was something wrong with that and he said you know the, the example that i've set growing up was that uh to work hard and achieve you know big goals and and that's and that's what he wants to do and so he he said you know he said that was for him and then my my younger son who's in his third year of college now he i had the same talk with him and i just said i'm you know I'm sorry if if I've done something to make it feel like you know being being average was uh, a failure, and he said that uh, he wants to graduate and he wants to join the service and maybe try to go to special forces too for the same reason. And so I don't know, I don't know. They they don't act, they act completely fine with it, and they love you know they love working hard and have big goals to achieve, and um, that part feels good. But sometimes I, I wonder if, you know, I don't know. I just second guess myself, I guess. Yeah, it's hard. High expectations you put on kids, it's, it's very difficult. Like you want to say, I just want them to be happy. Yeah. I just want them to live their lives on their path. And every, right. like every kid has their own personality. And, you know, your three kids are all uniquely different in their mm -hmm. own way. And who's to say, I mean, who's to say, all, I think all you can do is live by example and and support them and let them make the choices they that they decide to make yeah the problem is the choices that they've made are you know very stressful and very dangerous yeah and, you know i mean it might turn out that they might turn out like tim kennedy or someone like andy stumpf and be mm -hmm. an awesome human being but it's for you as a parent this is this incredibly stressful pressure-filled situation where you have to reevaluate how you raise them yeah and and what i always my, what I told them growing up always was, I don't care if you're the best at whatever you're doing, but because because not everybody can be the best. But I said, just give your best, just be your best. And so that's why if, if they're coasting or whatever, I'm like, I think you got some more. You got yeah. some more in you. And that's they, all I ever wanted them. The thing is about people that coast about stuff, if they have like a thought of doing better and they just don't put in the effort, they feel like shit. Yeah. You know, you, they feel like shit for you telling them that, but they feel like shit for sh for not doing well, too. Yeah, yeah. Especially if they have ambition. If you, Unrealized potential is a very fucking horrible feeling. Mm -hmm. you know, unrealized potential and um, unrealized expectations are just, it's like this feeling that you haven't done enough will keep you up at night. Yeah. It will fuck with your head. And that's, I just know how I felt not giving all I got. And I, I don't want, I didn't want my kids to feel like that. So I was just like, make sure you're giving your best, be your best. That's it. And, yeah. um, but then I, then I was like, what have I done? Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, I can only speak for myself. Um, you know, when I, when, when Tanner was born, I was young. Um, I don't, you know, being a parent is like, I feel like I'm better now than I was when I was 24 years old. And, um, you know, hopefully I'm pretty, maybe more, I'm different with my daughter. She's also a girl, so it's, it is just, that's different. But man, it's like, there's no blueprint on how to be the perfect parent. And now I'm like, I hope I did okay. Yeah, just, there's no blueprint. I mean, what's the blueprint? Be, be honest, give them the best, version of your thoughts on life that you can give them spend time with them when you can yeah then what is the what is the blueprint i mean just try to help them figure out their path in life and it's also hard too because you've got a full-time job i mean how much time do you dedicate to them you know how much time can you have yeah i mean it'd be it'd be great if i'd be like oh, i'm not going to work anymore i'm just going to hang out with the kids all day i mean it's not realistic yeah. and you can't do it. And then also to be the example, I felt like I would needed to set 
for the kids so they'd believe they could achieve whatever they wanted to, I had to put in work myself. I can't say you can be amazing while I'm half-assing stuff. When you say that you didn't reach your full potential until like later in life, like when do you feel like that was? I haven't. No, but I mean like you realize that you're like really pushing to reach your full potential now. <laughs> I still don't think I have. But, but you're pushing towards it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing more. And so I'm... When did that change? Um, God, I don't know. Maybe, maybe when I did my first hundred, so that's 2009, I felt what, what sac real sacrifice was. And I don't know, I, you know, hard hunts w when Roy and I would do super hard hunts, I'd felt like I was giving all I got backpack hunts deep yeah. into the back country. Yeah. 2008. I mean, I always did. Hard, I did hard hunts by myself in the Eagle Cap, but there's not really a great chance of dying in the Eagle Cap. You know, it's uh, you could, but um, you know that I felt like I was I was given all I had on on the hunts that required the most of me, and then at that same time, so that was 2007, 2008. Um, then at the same time, I was also ramping up what I did with running and pushing my body. 100 miles and things like that because you realized that you needed more endurance i just realized that I, ha I had i had i've been doing what i've been telling my kids not to do i've been coasting you know it still was more than a lot of people were doing but to me it felt like i i wasn't living up to my full potential so i'm like you know i want to do more and then that led to moab and um when i when i meet people and see people that are doing amazing things. It's just, it shows me what's possible. And so that's why I know I can, I have more to offer. That's a, a fascinating thing that, you know, you take these steps towards this journey and then you realize as you're making these steps that your capacity for work is increasing. So you have to push yourself further to test your body. And then, you know, a, a marathon seems out of reach, but then a marathon becomes a normal thing. Mm -hmm. And then a 50 miler, and then a 100 miler, and then a 205 miler, and then a 238 miler. And now mm -hmm. you were talking the other day with, I guess, Candace was considering a 500 miler. Yeah, yeah. She asked, and I know. Uh, that shit's ridiculous. I by know. The way. <laughs> Courtney and I said, both said we'd do it, and it would just be amazing. It would be, you know. Courtney that, DeWalter. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's, I mean, that's what people that do those type of races live for, the next big challenge. And, you know, when you haven't, when you can cross a finish line like I did Moab and Courtney did, she, you know, dominated, she had a great race in that race. But she, when you can finish a finish line and you're smiling, you're like, uh. Got a little more left. Got some more left. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why, you know, the sound of something epic, like 500 nonstop is is so incredible that sounds so insane that you'd run 238 miles and be basically halfway done yeah that's so well, stupid <laughs> i know but listen when we were 100 miles in yeah 100 miles is a long way and i told my brother who was with me taylor i go you know it's it's a different thought when you're not even halfway and you've just done 100 right 100 is hurts yeah but you're not halfway yeah. So it's the same thing. It's not, it's really not that much. It's just a change of mindset. How many days do you think you need to run 500? Well. I need a year. Can I do that? Yeah. Can I have a year? I need 10 hours of sleep at night. I was listening to Matthew Walker. Dr. Matthew Walker said I need 10 hours of <laughs> oh sleep at night. Oh, my God. Yeah. Courtney told me she slept one minute. <laughs> yeah. She, yeah. I had Three a, days. I had a one. Uh, no, she, she slept 20 some minutes total. No, she laid down for 20 Tw minutes and she couldn't sleep. Yeah. And then the one time that she slept, she slept for one minute. I did that exact... Taylor was there and I did the exact same thing for one minute because he was watching the watch and I fell asleep. There's a picture and I woke up. I was like, how long was I asleep? He goes a minute. I'm like, let's go. And for whatever reason, that minute, it does something. I don't know. What does it do? But she, she work? had, I don't have no idea. She said she woke up and she was angry that they let her sleep so long. Whoever her, was her. She, right. So she thought it was longer. Yeah. Too. And he was like, no, you only slept for a minute. She's yeah. like, oh shit. Well, let's go. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one thing I learned in that first 200 I did. Uh, Richard won that race, and that was a mistake I made. Is um, I was asking how how long he'd been sleeping, 
That was what you said. He sent right. me a quote, but you said, he go, fucking Richard, because he is like, <laughs> and he sent that. He says, that was the greatest day of my life when Joe Rog- Rogan said, fuck Richard Kessler. But uh, <laughs> but he, sl- he was sleeping short durations, like 15 minutes. And I, I didn't realize that your body will reset that quick. You thought you like needed like an hour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Yeah. And plus, you know, I'm sitting here, it's not like it's, I'm, God, it's really hard to be good at ultra marathoning and also be able to want to pack an elk. Right. You Having know, I mean, muscle. W- weighing yeah. what I weigh is not going to, so I, I, I kind of throwing myself in the category of Richard and in uh, Courtney, that's like, can't my, I can't do it at what I do. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to be be the best of both worlds, and it's just you're going to give up in both ends. Without being built like Zach Bitter, who's like 140. 140s, usually. Who ran, he, he's the one who ran the – he was on the podcast last week, and he ran the U.S. record of 100 miles in 11 hours and 40 minutes, averaging 7 minutes and yeah. 41 seconds. Or 702, wasn't 70, it? What was it? Yeah. 11, maybe? 11 hours and 40 minutes. So I think he ran, yeah, seven minutes, two seconds per mile, which is right. fucking madness. That's that's amazing. So fast. That's and he's so uh, impressive. And he's a meat eater. Oh, he is mostly he? Mostly eats meat. Oh, cool. He's like basically on a carnivore diet. He eats like steak constantly. He's on a very high fat diet. Yeah. High fat, high ste- high steak and protein diet. Yeah. Well, it's so yeah. I mean, to be the to be the optimal endurance athlete. Or, ultra endurance athlete in the mountains you need to be lighter yeah i mean i'm just I'm, i weigh too much yeah so but to be able to pack out an animal you need to have some weight on yeah you. i'm doing it to to be the best at bow hunting i'm yeah. not doing it to be the best runner and i'm not saying i could be i don't have the talent that I, i'm pretty tough but i mean they, they're super tough and super talented what is a talent for running what's the talent left um, foot right foot left foot right foot mm-hmm. it's not you know what i'm saying <laughs> It's not like you're painting. Uh, there's a talent. There, you know. There's uh What's It's endurance. Talent? It's endurance. Right. Yeah. I don't know if that's a talent, but it's there's it's, having great endurance is a thing. Mm. It's certainly a thing. Yeah. And and managing the body to get the most out of that endurance. Most knowing- most of it is is, and Courtney said this too. She didn't realize how far she could push, in the pain she was in. So. Her first hundred, she quit. First hundred mile, she dropped out of because she was in pain. That was it. Right. And she's like, oh, I can't do this. And then she quit. And she's like, wait a second. I quit for no reason. I quit just because I was in pain. So then after that, she realized pain is just part of the deal and hasn't quit since. And, and went. so she just didn't realize that p- the pain quotient of those races. Yeah, it's it doesn't feel good. Just because it doesn't feel good doesn't mean you stop. Right. You're, you, yeah. So, and that's that's the key. Most people can't push that, push through that amount of pain. It hurts. You know, it's the worst pain I've ever felt. What What hurts the most? It, it depends. It's like I've run and my foot starts hurting. I'm like, oh my god, this is it. I probably broke my foot. Maybe stress fracture. Then all of a sudden, my other knee hurts. I'm like, oh my. Okay, my my ligament is got tight because I got dehydrated. It's rubbing on my bone. And it's like, oh wait, no, this other right hip hurt. It's just like everything hurts, different things. Your feet get beat up. You got blisters. You're getting dried out. So things are just things are different in your body. Um, like I got a, a bone on top of my foot that rubs. And if I get dried out, that stuff's not sliding well enough. So that rubs and it swells up more. So it's just like all sorts of things happen. Yeah. People want everything to feel good. <laughs> they want to feel but, comfortable. And it like, does. You shouldn't push too hard. For you about just five be, miles. Just be comfortable. You should just be comfortable. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing is people. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this guy too that's that's been following me. I love I love the guy. And he's like. So he sees the pictures, he follows along. He's like, well, I want to do a hundred miler. And cause it se- sounds amazing. Right. Right. And, uh, signed up to do a hundred. It's one my brother just, just did recently. It's called Badger Mountain and, uh, hadn't done it before. I think he came and ran Pisgah, did about four summits once about 16 miles or whatever and went out and he's going to do a hundred miler after that. And, um, started 
throwing up at like mile 30, threw up like 13 times and couldn't walk, was dehydrated, throwing up. And it was the hardest thing to do, but he had to drop. And that, so there's, you're getting your body to a place where you can run that far. And then, so that's part, he hasn't been there yet. And I think part of that was he wasn't taking in salt. There's a lot of, a lot of things that go on with pushing your body that hard, but he got 50 miles done for, for me. I thought that was a great success because just people, just because they want to run a hundred doesn't necessarily mean you're going to, there's a lot of things that have to go into preparation and the tactics and, and fueling and everything else learning just like Courtney did learning just like he did. He got 50 in and now he signed up for Bigfoot. So he's going to do 205 miles. So he's going from dropping out at 50 to yep. 205 miles. Yep. And I think he can do it. It's a sickness. You guys are all sick in the head. I, I you think, guys are all getting sick together. I think he can do it. but And that's just as part of the process of learning what, what you're capable of. Right. And it's now, not – it doesn't happen like that. When you say take salts in, like what are you, what are you doing? Uh, they're called S-caps. So it's just salt pills. But I thought salt gives you high blood pressure and it's bad for you. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. But when you're sweaty <laughs> nonstop. It doesn't give you high blood pressure, folks. No. It's not bad for you. Okay. It's, uh, it's a fucking bad study from like the 1970s that people recite. Salt's an essential mineral. Um, so when you're, when you're t doing it, how much are you taking in? Take, I take salt every hour. And how much salt? A couple, pill, a couple of capsules of S-caps. So it's a couple caps like, like a... And if you don't, you won't make it. Really? No. Wow. Nope. So it's just your body just gets too dehydrated? Yeah. yeah. Too and, deficient. And what is the water in the salt? Like, how does it, what is it, what is, what's happening when you're taking salt? Uh, I don't know. But you know that everybody does it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly. But all I know is like, I remember the first time I did Western States, or I've only done it once, but it was a hundred miler in 2010. And I got to mile 55, I think, and I was dragging ass. You come out of the canyons, it's super hot in there. It's, you know, 90s or 100s in the canyon. So you come pop out onto mile 55, and I was hurting. And uh, and Sean Meisner, who's been a very good ultra runner for a long time, he's like, have you taken salt? I'm like, no, I haven't. So he gave me some salt right then, and it made – it took a little while, but made the biggest difference. That just salt. So you had never taken salt before? I hadn't. I I didn't take it the first fifty five miles. Oh wow! So yeah. then you you just got to get in that community and understand what they yeah. do and how they survive and, and how they fuel. How many people are doing that? Like, say, if you do Bigfoot, how many people are entering their race? When I did it, which was two years ago, is I think seventy some. Now I think she's over over hundred in all these races. Wow! It's a uh, yeah. So what Candace? Bird always says is 200, 200 is the new one hundred or one. So what, it, what what used to be a hundred was uh, like a long way. Right. It now is two hundred. Two hundred is the new one hundred. When did this change? When did it shift over? Uh, that like maybe twenty sixteen when I did Bigfoot. Maybe right in there. That's really recent. Yeah. So this whole sport is kind of evolving right the now. The 200s. The 200s are. And it's evolving based on how far people can that, 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 that are willing to push themselves are continuing to go past the boundaries. Yeah. So when this 500 does take place, when do yeah. they think that's going to happen? She hopes to do it next year. you got to quit your job. <laughs> quit your job. you got to run all day. No, I, I'd love you, to. You need a sneaker sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna I got be your one. agent. I'm gonna, I got one. I'm gonna Under get another armor. one. I'm gonna be your agent. I'm taking <laughs> over from here. Okay, do it. <laughs> you can't, yeah. You can't sell yourself. I'm gonna sell you. No, I'm. T I'm. Yeah, I'm terrible. I'm definitely terrible at business. Yeah. Well, you can't be good at everything. Yeah. That's a fact. It's not possible. I. The w number one thing I hate more than anything is when business screws up my passions. Mm, so when right. I hate the business of hunting. It sounds right. weird because I'm probably sitting here because of the business of hunting, but I can't stand it. I know what you're saying. The business of like the industry involved in hunting gear and it. goods and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I love hunting. I love the connection with the animals. I love doing what I do, and I know I have value. I, I get it. I mean, I have right. value because I put my name on stuff and they sell it. I hate it. Mm. That's probably why you're good at it. 
I don't know. Yeah, I think those those two are correlated. You know, I'm fucking terrible at the business part of comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I just I just want to do it. I don't I don't like thinking about the money part. Yeah, I don't. That's why I have managers and agents. Right. They take care of everything so that I can just be free. And if you're not, you, I you know you only have certain amount of resources. And if you put all your resources into the business side, mm -hmm. how are you going to have the concentration to do all the other things you're doing? Right. Practice shooting and running right. and all the, all the different I don't, things. You don't won't. have time. It'll fuck with your head, too. You got to... I mean, this is one of the things that I was thinking of when my phone didn't work for four days or three days, whatever it was, was that how much time I'm wasting, how much energy I'm wasting. Yeah. Like, you can only interact so much with other people's thoughts and ideas and mm -hmm. information. And you you have a lot of things already in your head that you're going over and thinking about and managing. And the more shit you stuff in there, it yeah. doesn't make you better at doing those original it things. It dilutes it. It dilutes it, yeah. yes. And it also diluted my, my peace of mind. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, you know, you, you only have a certain amount of resources in your life and you have to choose what's important to you and what's not. Yeah. You know, and I think it's real easy to get distracted. It's real easy to flood your brain with nonsense. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm good at a few things. So I try to focus on those. Yeah. I'm not and the, the business part. Yeah. You can take that over for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it over for you. I'm not even good at it, but I'm good at, I, I'm good at, what I'm good at is I know people that I like and what I like about them and what's yeah. interesting about them. Yeah. And I like promoting people. Like it's one of the things that I've, I've gotten out of this podcast that is, uh, there's a lot of things that I've gotten out of this podcast that are really like unexpected and peripheral. But one of them is the ability to make my friends famous. Yeah. Like this podcast has made Joey Diaz famous and Ari Shafir famous and Duncan Trussell famous. All these people that I think are amazing mm -hmm. that are I got a chance to let other people know about them. Yeah. And that's not the only reason why they became famous. They became famous because they're talented, but it gave them this unusual platform. Right. And I, I that that means a lot to me to help people. Like that's something that's very very rewarding to me. And it's almost along the same lines of being able to provide as a hunter and provide food, like to be able to provide, to let people know, you gotta, you gotta see this guy, this guy's awesome. Or even things, people that I don't even, I don't even know people, like their documentary, I see a documentary, it's fucking yeah. amazing, I wanna mm -hmm. tell people about it. I like promoting things, I yeah. like telling, and I, without any expectation of something coming back to me in return. Yeah. I like, I just like, tell, like I, people um, say like, oh, you know, you're doing ads for products on your Instagram. Never have. Yeah. Everything that I've ever put up on Instagram, unless it's my own stuff, mm -hmm. unless it's like my fanny packs or something that I sell, anything that I've ever put, put on, like people accuse me of like working for Vibram's five right. finger yeah. shoes. I'm like, no, yeah. I like them. Right. I like them. I don't want anything from them. Yeah. You know, this is, I wear them all the time. This is why I think they're good. I think they build your feet up. I know my feet are stronger because I run with these things. Yeah, like, exactly. oh, you fucking chill. Like, no, that's not <laughs> what I'm doing. And it's like, that's the one thing of having financial independence that's, yeah. that's really rewarding is that I don't have to think like that. Yeah. You know, like I've been offered uh, to do ads on Instagram. I'm like, no, I can't because unless, I, unless it was something I super believed in. Yeah. Then I might I might consider doing it, but I could never do it with some nonsense like Coca Cola or something like that. Because what then, about skinny tea? What's that? Skinny tea? What's skinny know. tea? I see the girls do it. What is skinny tea? That's a thing on Instagram. Like see this fucking guy. Models. I go to see, him. He knows everything. I go to him. Hey, all what, the young kids. No, no, he's got. What's that called again? What do you know? What's going on? Uh, he's a liaison. No, 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 no. But he's a. Uh, did Duncan say it? Remember, he kept saying it. When you know it's like popular, oh, what's the term? I I was we talked about a dinner. Yeah, I don't remember. Doubles Duncan just kept going on about Lil B. <laughs> I know Lil but B the bass guy. He's also saying like because <laughs> Gucci is yeah. like the kids knew and mm -hmm. like yeah. but there's a word zeitgeist. Yes. Oh yes. It's in the zeitgeist. So that's Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> 
Jamie's. I'm not a zeitgeist, but I know uh, what's floating on. Jamie top. is <laughs> online all day, and he's <sighs> just ever ever since the Eddie Bravo podcast, just been blocking people. Yeah, it's always he's on a blocking rampage. Not everyone, just shitty people. <laughs> just, just shitty people. <laughs> that's that's like most. So what is skinny tea? What is that? Oh, it's like detox tea. It's like a thing that people promote. They post a picture. I drink my tea every day, and it's making detoxing detoxifying. Right. and they're yeah. getting paid to promote For this. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well. Wasn't that thing you were telling me that Gary Vee was saying that, you know, you can get a lot of money for your Instagram posts? And- yes. I saw like on a Good Morning America thing he did that. If you have 100,000 followers, I believe you can get up to about $5,000 per post. And That's so crazy. If you have a million, it, it ramp, ramps up way high, 20 grand a post. There, there was this 20 gr- grand a post? Yeah. yeah okay, no, I'm there's... changing my tune. <laughs> I'm going to sell out now. I'm offering my services to anything that sucks. There's this girl... <laughs> And I can't remember who, what, she was in a movie. Can't She's sort of cute, but kind of unique looking. She was getting 65,000 an Instagram post and 20,000 a story post. What? Yeah. She said she bought a house. For doing, wait a minute. From, I need to sell out. <laughs> you what do. Do, what do I? What do I sell out to? Who do I sell out to? Anybody. Everyone. How, Vibrams, how much money you got? <laughs> you know I've been promoting you for free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, you owe me. (laughs) (laughs) No, I can't. The only thing I would ever promote is I. I, It's like the same thing. I feel about the the stuff that I promote for free. Yeah, it would have to be something that I like, believed in. Yeah, it would have to like uh, like Hoyt. If Hoyt came to me and said, uh, "Will you?" I'm wearing a Hoyt hat. You are. If you would, would you promote our balls? I'm like, fuck yeah! I shoot them every day. They're awesome. (laughs) Yeah, they they actually put your picture up. Me and you. Beautiful. Yeah. Put it up. Well, no, I mean you joke around. Well, you weren't joking about you like helping your friends, but I don't know how long the uh, powerful Joe Rogan, how long has the powerful Joe Rogan been around? The saying? Yeah, I yeah. I don't know. It's but, been a while. But the point is, is like now that this is powerful because if I put up, hey, where'd you hear about or where'd you start following me from or where'd you hear about what I do? I don't know. 80% is Joe Rogan show. Joe Rogan experience. And so it, it's been a saying for a long time, but it is powerful. You know what's it's, really crazy? Burt Kreischer was at the airport, and this lady said she was in her 60s, walked up, she goes, powerful Burt Kreischer. <laughs> and he was like, what the fuck? Yes. And he texted me, he goes, dude, that was crazy. Yeah. He's like, this is like an older lady. Yeah. He said, powerful Burt Kreischer. All right. And he was like, whoa. He goes, that's when it hit me. He was like, yeah. what the fuck? I'm reaching... Like middle-aged ladies. Yeah. Is Past it, middle-aged ladies. If she lives to be 120, that's yeah. a hell of a lady. No, because we're middle-aged. Yeah, we're middle-aged. If everything <laughs> goes perfect. <laughs> yeah. But with science today, I think we're probably not even. I think we're probably one-third aged. Yeah. I think it's 100% easy today that someone's going to live to be 150. I don't think there's any question whatsoever. Yeah. With stem cell treatments and all this other crazy new- 150? Yep. Whew. Yeah, I believe that. I believe people that are alive today, because I think technology and medical science is increasing its viability and its potential so fast. And there's so many people working on things all the time that if you do everything right right now, I think we're going to see people that are alive today, they're going to hit 150. And I think the people that are born like five years from now, 10 years from now, they'll probably hit 200. Um, Woo. Before we go. Before we go. Chicago. UFC. Ooh, it's gonna be a good one. Colby Covington, don't snap me. Don't slap me. When <laughs> they said you're gonna slap me, don't slap me. Why is he, talking shit? Why is he gonna slap you? Because I was telling them that John Jones might slap him. Oh, yeah, he's, he's gonna like, slap, I might you? slap you. I like Colby. I like what he's doing. He's talking a lot of shit. I'm just saying, be careful who you talk shit to. <laughs> talking shit to John Jones, he's one of the baddest motherfuckers yeah. that's ever lived. Well, you you know, he's Col- making a lot of money. He's being who? smart. Oh, Colby, the reason yeah. why Colby is fighting for the title, the reason why Colby's going to fight Rafael dos Anjos for the inter- interim title, is not just because he's beaten good guys because he has he beat Damian Maya, but it's more importantly that he's got he's going to put asses in the seats. Well, that's f- part of the fight business. It's part of the fight business now. You got to sell. I mean, yeah, especially There's nowadays. Pre and post Conor McGregor, right? And post Conor McGregor, the fucking game has changed. Yeah. It's red panties night, baby. <laughs> Everything is different. It is, and it's just like I see people hate on on Colby for you know, did he deserve the shot? All I know is he wins one fight, he's holding the belt. 
Yeah, I mean, if you look at who one more he's, fight, who not he's one. beaten, pull up his record. Let me see his record. If you look at who he's beaten in comparison to somebody, like there's some people that have been calling him out that can't get a fight with him. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Kamaru Usman wants to fight him, and that guy's a beast. Yeah. And then there's some other guys that are really talented but haven't beaten like any high-level guys yet. Uh, okay, so he lost to Warley Alves. Yeah. And then look at the guys he's beaten. Brian Barberina is a good guy. Dong Young Kim is a, is a tough guy. Stung Gun Kim. And Damian Maya. That is not really, I mean, I'm just going to be honest. This is not a resume of someone who you would normally see fighting for the title right now. Mm-hmm. I think he's fighting for the title based not just on his de- beat, beating Damian Maya, who's a really tough guy, mm-hmm. but I think. On the fact that he's a controversial, very popular character because yeah. he talks so much shit, yeah, and because he's talked so much shit about Brazilians, and he and dominated fighting. Maya yes, in he did. Brazil. Yes, he did. I mean, it was it yep. was a domination. He dominated him, and it's a uh, what, what I that think, was a big victory. But that was yeah. his only big victory over a titled a former title challenger. Yeah. Who's like a top level guy who's also forty years old. Right. I mean, Damian Maya is his best days are behind him. Just yeah. as I say this as a huge Damian Maya fan. Yeah. Well, I you know, I look at it as you can't take too much away from Colby because I think of a lot of great fighters, say so if you say Nate Diaz, who's been an icon for years, one of my favorite of all time, he's never fought for a title. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. So true. If, if Colby got there, however he got there, he wins one more fight. He's holding that belt. I think about fighters who've come up and maybe they've been, you know, quieter. Maybe they haven't s- sold their fights. Maybe like as as well as Colby has, and so they've been grinding it out, beating good guys. Maybe because they've taken that slow road. Maybe somebody gets lucky in one of these fights and and catches them on the chin, and then they're two rungs back and then they got to grind all the way back up that's a lot of damage they're taking where colby didn't have to i mean he played the game the right way for today and it's paying off yeah he only has one loss yeah i mean i think he's 11 and one now but you know but other people would say well look at guys like anderson silva didn't talk any shit just fuck people up yeah you know and and became one of the greatest of all time because of that yeah it's true. You know, you could you could look at it like, do you want to get that shot at the title, or do you want to be the greatest that's ever done it? Like, how? What is the difference? I would rather get the title and then show I'm the greatest. Mm. I well, mean, they're, right, right. They're not mutually exclusive. No, right. No. Yeah. So I mean, if he wins, then he'll probably get a, a fight with Woodley, right? Oh, he will definitely get a fight with Woodley if he wins. One hundred percent. Right. So, so what if what if that happens? And what if Woodley showed a video today? I don't even know understand how the fuck he did this, but Tyron Woodley has a video up on Instagram with him and uh, Tiki Gosen, and uh, he's hitting the pads. He just had fucking shoulder surgery. Yeah. I mean, he had shoulder surgery. Like, watch this. I mean, he had fucking shoulder surgery like four months ago, and he's firing up the pads. I don't even know how he did this. Which shoulder? That one. That right? Yes. <laughs> he looks like a freaking beast. He is a fucking beast. Oh, my. He's a legit beast. God. Colby but, says he's a nerd. Oh, get the fuck out <laughs> of here. Kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, he's, just, he's talked shit about him for he sure. He said nerd He said he would something. break him. <laughs> he said he would break him. But look, you, Tyron that, Woodley. God, he puts, looks amazing. He puts people to sleep. It's just insane that that shoulder was operated on. He looks on, amazing. I want to say like four months ago. Yeah. I don't even understand it. That doesn't even make sense. That's impressive. Like four months after shoulder surgery, you're supposed to be like doing like those little pink weights that chicks yeah. use <laughs> yes. in Pilates class. You're supposed to be doing this. Well, You know, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, but... Tyron's very smart, and he's very smart with his rehabilitation. Like yeah. He's doing PRP and everything yeah. he can, stem cells, everything he can to rejuvenate all that tissue. But that's just, that's insanely impressive. Unless, unless Uh-oh. that is an that old, old video? video that he's fucking banked. Ooh. He's like, these bitches, I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to leave him scared. Yeah. But Wonder know. Boy's furious. Wonder Boy's furious that Colby's getting that shot. Yeah. Because Wonder Boy's like, Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Like, how am I not fighting for the interim title? You know, I just, he it's just, true. yeah. Yeah. I mean, he just beat Jorge Masvidal. You know, yeah. he had those two really close fights with Woodley. You know, he, I mean, he's, he's beaten, you know, a fucking who's who. Yeah. Well, it's, 
I get, I, cause Colby has worked out with me, you know, he's from, we're from the same town back there. And so people are like, I can't believe you support whatever, like Colby going he's a blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, he's just doing his job. I don't want to he's selling fuck a up his game, but that's not how he is in real life. No, he's a great guy. He's like <laughs> his, him and his dad came and lifted with us. They're they're the nicest people ever. So it's just like it's a smart come move. Come on, guys. Look, yeah, it's did, a smart it move. It worked. Yeah. It worked. He did get hit in the head with a boomerang for it though. Hey, you take take a little, you know. You take your you take your lumps. <laughs> you take your lumps. Yeah. It happens. It does but happen. All I know is he wins one more fight and he's got the UFC belt. Yeah. How amazing well, he's is got that? The interim belt. Hey, it's a belt. It is a belt. I don't care what it kind of a belt. It's well, a belt. Uh, Tyron Willie calls it the boo boo belt. Whatever. Because he's got an injury, and that's the only reason why they're it's still super for shiny. Fight. It's very shiny, and it's still gonna be around his waist. Yep. yep. If he wins, it's true. Yeah. So I mean, it'll be in his fucking <laughs> his trophy cabinet. Exactly. It's a fucking belt. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'm pumped. Oh God, I'm so pumped. It's gonna be. I, June, I love. You're gonna be there. Yeah. We're gonna have some fun. That's gonna be uh, that card. Pull up that June UFC card. That is a killer card. Um. There's some real good fights on that card. Is that the card with Derek Lewis and Francis Ngannou? Oh, God, I don't think so. Is it? I want to say it is. I don't think. I want to say it is. No? Which one's that? Is that Vegas? Whitaker Romero. Whitaker Romero. Ooh. Ooh. God. Oh, Jesus. Oh. Make that a little bigger so Daddy can see. Whitaker Look versus Romero. I Romero's love that. Romero's body. He's a freak of freaks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> the freak of free Overeem it's, versus Curtis dude, Blades too. CM Punk. Woo! CM Punk versus Michael Jackson. Both guys. Holly's fighting. Both guys are zero and one. Wait, are Holly all the, Holmes fighting Megan Anderson? Overeem? Megan Anderson is a fucking killer, bro. Megan Anderson. This is going to be her first fight in the UFC. She's a legit beast and a challenge at 145. Look she's, at this card. She's legit as fuck. Yeah, Mursad Bektik versus Ricardo Lamas. That's fucking awesome. Woo! That's we got, a, we got Orlovsky. We got Legends. Clay Guida versus Bobby Green. Woo! Rashad yeah. Evans. Yeah, yeah. There's some good fights. Real good fights. God. Yeah. Oh, this is gonna be the greatest. Benavides versus Pettis. God damn. Yeah. This is very good. Yeah. Very good. I I really hope not not all these fall through like normal. Well, we have only a month, and then it'll be One Holly month. fighting Romero. <laughs> 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 That'll be all that's left. Robert Whitaker, Yoel Romero is a fucking banging fight for Chicago. Yeah. God damn. Dos Anjos versus Covington, though. That's the fight. That's the fight. Because Dos Anjos at 170 has been a fucking monster. Because yeah. he's one of those guys that was cutting so much weight to make 155. Right. He just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. I mean, he was just beating his body up. And then he moves up to 170, and he looks like a fucking killer again. He looks like a world beater at 170, and he's been trying to fight Woodley, and he just beat the shit out of Robbie Lawler. Yeah. So that's a big fight for him and a big fight for Colby. Oh, God. For the interim title. Yep. Woo! Can't wait. Can't wait. Chicago, was it the 8th? 9th. June yeah. 9th. I wish I could go into coma till then. No, you don't. Yes. You have marathons to run. Oh. And arrows to shoot. That's true. Speaking of which, let's go shoot some arrows. Let's, let's do Let's wrap it. this up. All, All right, right, folks. Uh, Michael Chandler will be here on Monday. I'll yes. tell you who I got. I got a lot of fucking people going down. I got a yes. lot of podcasts this week. I kids. love Chandler. Yeah, I love him too. Um, Matt Taibbi will be here this week. Uh, my friend Mike Baker. Uh, I got a lot of shit happening. All right. We'll see you soon, folks. Love you. Bye.